OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Half past seven Friday morning, OTB AM. Good morning to you, Shane. Good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian. Good morning, Colin. Hello, how are you getting on? Nice. Uh, we always to, we've always tried to outdo yourself. The hardest is this? man in show business, Adrian Barry. I tr- uh, threw on news round last night, as is my want. Mm. And <laughs> I, you're on mute. That uh, just, it's, just, it's only right. It's only right with a jacket like that, says Adrian. Yeah. I threw on the news round last night, mind my own business, uh, doing the dinner, and up steps Adrian Barry. <laughs> <laughs> presenting. Present- yeah. 12 hours before presenting this show, some sort of employment law infringed there, is there? A double whammy of Adrian Shane, Barry. Shane, uh, Colm, you're still muted, I, I, uh, I believe. Which, I mean, I think that from the audience YouTube, YouTube view, commenters, not the, let uh, us know if you want to st- uh, call him to stay mute, muted or if you'd like him to... Do a one, two, three there and see uh, you live or where are you? Well, it should be fine. I uh, think we're uh, fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're up and running. Oh, good, okay. man, good man, good man. I was told I was muted. Thanks, then for I actually, coming, thanks for coming in. Well, I was told I was muted, then I muted myself. He's, he's, he's a bit, bit slow today, Shane. He's a bit slow. Mm. I'm actually... Uh, I've, never been fa- I've never been faster. What I was trying to say was... Um, I, com- was do you know, the, the I was complimenting your with, uh, presenting skills. comes a bit with ageing, I find. Like it does. You know, you, as you move, cycle through the years. Whoa, hang on. Someone's birthday today, isn't it, Colm? Happy birthday, Colm. Thanks. Birthday much. wishes, Colm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. Yeah. Are you allowed to tell us what number it is, or...? Is ah, look, private? listen, you know, in life you do... In life you do your big thing... Uh, at a certain age, apparently, and uh, that's been the last year. And look, it's just what, been, what, 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 what the combination of words made no sense. What so, in life, about? apparently, you do your big thing at a certain age in life. Like, uh, get a bit dithery, isn't he? With yeah. and <laughs> that was uh, that's a that's a thirty three years of age is the great thing oh, you do sorry. in life. And that was, that? that's been the last year for me, so now I'm a, a year older. What are you talking about? So now you're 34. I'm now 34. Can you make any sense of what uh, it's and look, um, and look, it's been a good year. Uh, we got there in the end. I, are you, uh, what's your point about being 33? I don't I don't. I was told one time, in this, uh, I was in a lecture there in college one time, and uh, some lecturer said, uh, apparently the year that you do the great thing in your life is 33 years sure, of that's age. Just that's just bullshit. Like, that's depressing. Jesus. All right. Like, I'm uh, just talking. It's doing what? a bit of talking. Like, God almighty. At least I haven't so, reached that yet. You anyway. I was thinking about that in the last well, year. Well, becoming producer of OTBM then must be it. Is that, that what we're saying? Mm. Well, no. It Buying that jacket. It'd be fair, but don't know. But I was, oh, uh, wow. <laughs> I was, wow. uh, no, I had some good moments in the last year and uh, I just, just like What were they? Come on, give us some reflections on Highlights. the year that was. No, just this a lot happened. I was just looking there in uh, thinking this morning, oh yeah, that happened in the last year and that did, yeah, but I'd rather not divulge, like, but it was just wow. uh, an interesting last 12 months and uh, I'm just happy to be here. Well, we're delighted to and have th- you. Thanks and, for having me. Um, you know, at times people have commented on a bit of tension between us, but it's a good opportunity between to, you and I. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to have that. that. The feedback has come via yourself. So, um, mm. but listen, it's it's uh, you know, I think it should be said that you know. I was asked. Yeah, uh, I was saying, do you does yourself and your man Asian get on? Yeah. It's like oh, very well. Why? Yeah. And then I watched back. And I was like, oh Jesus, yeah. Yeah, it's just sometimes tension, you've yeah. got some outrageous. Oh, well, I, know, I only respond yeah. to you really. I'm just responding to the way you oh, talk. That's fair enough, do you know what I mean? No, I like to just sit back sometimes and watch the two of you go at it like. And just it's it's quite entertaining when you disagree on something, and uh, I think the YouTube commenters I tend would to disagree with, agree. M- nearly with most. He of, says to yeah. be honest with you, Shane, but like yeah, no. well, same. I don't think we. It'd be an inexactitude. We could have top five things that we agreed on because it would be like it would be short list. Anyway, like, listen, know. happy birthday! Are you what? What have you got planned for the weekend? Is there? Uh, I don't know. Like I, I think. Well, um, there's the, the 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 work Christmas party tonight, Shane. That well, we'll, of we'll all be there, and we'll be. Well, will so you be there? We'll, so we'll see you at that. Yeah. Will you be there? Oh yeah. You told me you weren't going oh, the other I'm day. Definitely going. You told me the other day you weren't going. 100 going. You definitely. So you'll be at that going. anyway with your colleagues. No, I. Uh, colleague that you are. No, I'm being I'm being taken away. Um, I'm actually going to judge how well this conversation is going by Jojo's reaction out there. He's literally put his uh, head in his hands being like, what are you talking about? But mm. this is... Uh, Me and you both, Jojo. Um, yeah. No, like I'm being taken away. And uh, so I, I don't know where I'm going. It I, don't know, it I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going this evening, but uh, right. it won't be the Christmas party anyway. We'll we'll have a drink in well, your honour. Congrats, your anyway. thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, it'll be, it'll be it'll be the worst party uh, uh, for the fact that you're not there, Shane. Is always obliged by contract that's to say fair. that, even though it's yeah. Well, no, that's uh, ah yes, look at um, but no, no. Thanks for that. Thanks for the birthday wishes. Yeah, I appreciate Glad. it. Uh, the jacket is loud enough, says uh, Jim Sullivan. Jacket is intense, but I'll allow it. Uh, says Spectre Core. Mm. Uh, I would go with jacket is intense. But let's not ever. I actually again. found that I found it in the back of the wardrobe there this morning. I was like, Jesus, yeah, there's that yoke. Oh, I must wear that. And I had said to Shane, I was going to wear something. Yeah, and then yeah. you went very. Uh, I, I totally forgot this morning. The snow put me. The snow put me off, lads. Completely threw me off kilter. I was like, now, I woke up and looked out. And I was like, oh, what? Since I was with you last, Shane, you you were ratioed online. I was ratioed, yeah. 
Oh yeah, well, you, you can't say anything these days. But yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I had a take. You had a, you had but, a take, um, and people felt it was called. It, it, yeah, people. Felt, generally speaking, some people agreed with me. Um, mostly the people that agreed with Did me they? messaged me directly, <laughs> as opposed to voicing. This is their very opinions. Donald Trump. A lot of people have been in touch. <laughs> a lot of people have reached out yeah. to me to tell me. But everybody you've seen have said something else. But I was correct. These people in my yeah. So re, I, did re, people really DM well, me, or are you just making that up? No, genuinely, okay. pe- people message me. Goes, I, I, I actually agree with you. Okay, and I'm talking about ex-players your, as well. Your dad players. and your sister were in touch. No, <laughs> literal pundits of the game. Um, so Cal oh. Milani set me up. Come on, do you want out anybody? There, I don't want to out them because I, I assume they messaged me directly because, because they didn't want to be seen. They didn't to be, want to be seen to be agreed oh, with me. Oh wow! Um, but they did agree. Uh, a good number of them <laughs> offline. <laughs> good number offline. Good number. Of course, the the ones online. So the the take was essentially: Cal Milani set me up and said, "How do you think Kill McCud would fare at an intercounty level?" Yes, yeah, I said. Question, well, yeah. I said they'd probably win the Talton Cup. Um, now, if I was feeling a little bit. I don't uh, be backtracking that. On the fence, I would have said they'd probably win Division Four, which one hundred percent is fa- is fact. Um, but I probably took it a step further and said, um, <laughs> but as Limmy, the great Limmy once said, don't back down, double down. <laughs> so I'm going to double down on this and uh, just back myself. Yeah, I think I think with it, with with um, with Mannion and Walsh in the team, they'll, they'll do some damage in Division Three and hence challenge for the Talton Cup. Surely, I'm not I'm not um, I'm not saying outright uh, uh, like Westmead and Cavan clearly are strong I don't think squads. They would. I don't think they would. I don't think they would. I think that look, I uh, I it, it's not um. It was been certainly some of the people that had been ratioing you were presenting it as a very binary conversation. And it isn't that because it can't be by the very nature of the fact that that uh, you know the club can get better as Crokes have done by bringing in Shane Walsh. Um, like it, I you know I it's a it's a it's uh, how do I best word this? Like it's a hard comparison mm. because you have a lot of players on that Crokes team. And we're using those as an example, but as you said yourself, you could be talking about any of the clubs that compete at the top end. Yeah, that's the point. Who yeah. wouldn't obviously have a chance of getting onto a, an inter county squad, which yeah. uh, which is the difference. Even if you're playing for a Carlo or or a whoever or a Monaghan or one of these uh, so called weak oh, counties, Division One team um, for the last that, that, ten years, you know that that you have to be at a certain level no matter what county you're at to get to that grade. Yeah. So, um, well, Kilmacud wouldn't beat Monaghan. Not a chance of that. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 it'd be, I, I would be interested to see. It's such a hypothetical question that we we'll never get to see a competitive answer for. Yeah, that's. The I thing. would be interested to see. I can't imagine there's a huge, huge amount of intercounty teams that they would beat. Some people saw it as disrespect to Kilku and Glen and these other teams because I was looking past Kilmacud and Kilmacud haven't even won the All Ireland yet. But and I actually it think it wasn't the point you were. Making. It wasn't the point because I uh, would put lump Kilku and. Uh, Glenn and I actually in the same clip said I think Glenn will win the All Ireland this year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, some of the comments were uh, were interesting to say the least. So Liam on Twitter said this has to be the worst comment ever made in GEA. Oh, wow, which was uh, up top three anyway. I'd I, say. Yeah, Liam. Uh, these lads haven't got a clue. Says John. These lads being me. Um, Thomas says can't even win the All Ireland club, but they co- come through a shockingly poor Leinster Championship, and people think they can beat in the county sides. Kilku and Glenn licking their lips at the Kilmacud hype train. Mick Foley, um, of course. We, Opinion we very much respect Sunday Times. I'll always remember Carl Mannion from St. Bridget's telling me he came back from a club winning campaign to Division 3 football with Russ Common and his head was spinning for the first half of his comeback game. It's an apples and oranges comparison, pointless. Fair enough. It probably is apples and oranges. As you say, we're never going to actually Inside, find out. Yeah. And Eamon McGee uh, said, No, Cora Finn were the greatest club side of all time and they wouldn't win it. Um, they, like, he, he kind of, Eamon's suggesting they'd probably, probably come within six or seven points of. Yeah, that's not a monster gap. That's why I say it's not a binary conversation. Yeah. Right? Like, that's not a huge gap. And uh, obviously, these teams can get, you know, they can be, uh, they can get a little bit better. They can get a little bit worse. Yeah. And like, divisional sides like East Kerry, like, we kind of spoke to David Moran about it on the show yesterday. And he was kind of, divisional sides will probably beat, like, East Kerry yeah, will probably beat a lot of sides. Kind of, yeah, it's true. They, they're half county sides, essentially. Yeah. They're, they're weird. <laughs> bit strange. Talk talk of Ross Common going, going that direction as well now. Right. They're changing the structures to divisional. So, interesting to see. Um, I was at uh, Crow Park supporting Crooks on uh, Sunday. Not, and, not the Westmead Club, as we've no, no, as we've established. I get in at half time at the hurling, and it was uh, I had two young kids with me just before anybody mentions that. So knocking four hours out of it was definitely going to be impossible. So Fair I enough. think a match and a half was as good as we're going to get. What a half of hurling that second half of the uh, Bally Hill game was. What a half of hurling they were. It was one of those games where you just everybody accepted at half time that the game was over. Yeah, and then suddenly they got it back, and I was there with a six year old and four year old was trying to coerce them into like uh, you know um, 
being engaged as much as they could with the game and like that's hard enough battle at the best of times but the fact that the drama was like hyped up and everybody like I found myself jumping up at one point one of the goals went in and I was like come on that's uh-huh. it like you know the way you sort of have having a battle with yeah, someone yeah. from around you so listen uh, very good and then the and then the football was very disappointing mm. uh, there was a, the, a Downs lad sitting beside me and he said Ara, it was only the game was only about 15-20 minutes old he said sure it's like a training match for them it's and that strange, was it, like, it? it was huge disappointing uh, the attendance was <laughs> also like the whole atmosphere was I don't know why the game was at Crow Park, I have to say. Mm. Couldn't, if they'd put it into, I don't know what the official attendance was, but it wasn't, I can't imagine if they put it into Parnell Park that it would have been uh, anywhere near full. And I'm not even suggesting it should have been a Parnell Park because yeah. you're probably giving an advantage over to, well, maybe not to Croak so much, but you could have had it in any big Leinster provincial ground that you want. Um, it doesn't, I, maybe there's a reward for the players that you, you know, if you get this far, you get to play at Crow Park. Mm. That's the biggest bit of the argument I would buy. But by and large, it was a bit soulless. Yeah, I understand it from the uh, from the promotion point of view. I understand why it's at HQ. Like, I get that. But was it the where you were sitting, the only side of the same that was populated at all? Yeah, yeah. There yeah. Was just like so, you were looking into the ether. Yeah, there was, yeah. there was exactly. There was like a good portion of people on the Hogan stand in their regular lower tier seating and the premium, and that was it. There wasn't a soul anywhere else. And I will say the other point that I obviously go back to a lot around the GA <laughs> is the elitist uh, approach. Our collective elitist approach to GA in mm. that we have conversations and we focus on the top four or five teams in the country and that's it. And uh, I have a real bee in my bonnet about that one. But coming from a county like Westmead and a club like Atlone that I come from originally, uh, like I haven't really been outside of a few spikes with Westmead at, time, uh, yeah. at times. Been that exposed to like how amazing it is to support a team that are uh, like you won't really have too much of an insight into that, Jane. Well, you turn, uh, county level? You live a little bit. Uh, yeah. Great yeah, days yeah. winning Ulster Championships and, yeah. and staying in the... Not, not like it's not like uh, what I'm talking about is like the Dublins, the Kerrys, Donegal's, more latterly, mm-hmm. Mayo, uh, Galway to a lesser degree over the years, um, like that sort of thing where you're where you're I you know I get a bit of an, in, an insight parachuted into a club that are successful and are always sort of there thereabouts. It's an incredible experience. I have to say I feel a bit like your man in the Matrix who's mm. like you know he gets the offer of which I have to go back to real life where you know you can do all this stuff or. You know, you know, you're you're eating the steak. You've taken and the you kill know the, the steak is uh, fake. Yeah, but like at the same time, you get to eat the steak and it's and it's tasty. And tell so, me, yeah. um, the man who was next to you uh, at Crow Park from the Downs. Yeah, he was that talking to you. Number one, uh, did he know who you were? How would he know? I am no. Did well, you told me another anecdote about a shopping centre recently where the, um, some Santa knew who you were. Santa's Elves. Oh, that wasn't a shopping centre. That was yeah. the, Santa uh, knows you. Santa that knew was the, you were. the Chemical Croaks. Uh, we had our, our uh, Academy yeah. um, Santa Day yeah. on Santa Day. And Santa they knew who you were? He was probably confused by he the said, West, West Mead accent. He, he said I was on the jersey. naughty list. He call, Santa called me out straight off the bat. No doubt. You're on the naughty list for the stuff you've been saying about Croaks. <laughs> and I was like, Santa, it's not me. It's the other guys. So he didn't know. Okay, so second, did he pick up on an accent? No, no. None of, none of the above. Okay, no. and if he had, do you think he would have been outraged that Not a Westmead man was going against a Westmead club? He, if if he was a very one-dimensional character who thought about things that way, fair enough. But then if he had understood that I was literally a paying member you, of Chemical Croaks and was there like twice a week, every week. But is it not in any way conflicting in any uh, moral of your being that none, you're going against absolutely none. a club I, from your own county, regardless no, of where they're from in your county? I have no affiliation with the Downs at all in the slightest whereas I pay my membership for Kim Cook Croaks I'm there twice a week they get plenty of those membership fees as well there's 4,000 is, sure. is, is there that much hostility between Athlone and Monongar it not, it's nothing to do with the hostility like I'm outside of Athlone no matter who they were playing do you hate the downs Adrian just, just admit <laughs> it yeah. uh, get off the you, you tried to join a GA club Qu- quote up that. in Dublin quote right? that and yeah, they, they, yeah they, they wouldn't have me. They, they, they I couldn't ha- do that. They Balagin. wouldn't have him. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have him. Imagine. They didn't, accent, even, they didn't even reply uh, to Well, they didn't pick it up in the email, but I was uh, <laughs> I emailed. I was like, look, this is my he situation. He a big life story. No, I, I was like, can I, just, can I just train with you? Yeah. And uh, it's only down the road, like, rings end. And uh, no reply, like, never got a reply, ever. I must yeah. check my junk mail, but I don't, I never got a reply. I never got a reply. I could train with the team in Dublin, but I could never, ever play for a different club. Like I play, I play soccer back home with one in town. Ah, will you stop? But I couldn't, I couldn't play for a team up in Dublin. I couldn't. Huh? Not a chance. That's like Simon Zebo saying I never play for Leinster. I train with them and then go home for the game. Yeah, you're talking about uh, either or, either code. Ah, stop. Shit. Not a hope. That's ridiculous. Too loyal. If they were offering, offering you now fifty quid, one, fifty quid a week, you'd be one man, one club, one woman, one club. That you, you've one club. If they were offering you a little bit of cheeky 
crease the wheels. First of all, I wouldn't, be, I, would, I wouldn't be getting money off it him. It wouldn't but, be that standard. No, I wouldn't exactly. be that standard. But I mean, I just never would. No, I wouldn't do it. it like, I, I'm living in Dublin now. But Asher, it, that's daft. Not a, not a hope. I'm no, surprised. No. Maybe I'm uh, really misreading the rumours. I'm a Monaghan so Harps. Interested to know if there are people out Mon- there who are in the same boat, but Monaghan Harps club man and GA Monaghan Town that makes and soccer. No sense. It does make sense. It's the club I grew up with and played with since I was six or seven. Do you know that you have a loyalty to your well, club? Tr- you do, and then you you move. can't just turn around because you then, move up to the big smoke yeah, and all of, of a sudden start wearing your back and you scarves and your. Of course you can. Cheese and wine, and, and for practical reasons, can't you? Richard Redbone, like Shane, w- Shane Walsh style. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't you know? train with the club. Shane Walsh loves Galway, but it makes you're more the sense. The anti Shane Walsh. I'd never play with a different club. Uh, that does well, to me now. I have to. Say, you're here full time. If I lived in Cork, do you know? I, I yeah, couldn't, that's I couldn't the, travel home from a match. Yeah, but three Dub- hours, like Dublin yeah. to Monaghan is is grand. You know, um, Richard Redball says that Adrian gets invited to present medals in Kilmacudder this stage. I mean, I haven't done. I'm certainly open to the offer, but that hasn't. Uh, uh, Michael says elitism in uh, Irish sport is an issue Croaks are a great example of this in my opinion and I uh, have a half an hour response to that Michael at some point that I'll give you but uh, the short version of which is it couldn't be any more elitist uh, you're coming from a place there of having no insight into the club whatsoever couldn't be any more elitist couldn't be any any less yeah. elitist no you're right the first time what, I, what I meant to say Elaborate thank there. you for pointing that out Chen. Uh it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really the opposite of that yeah. so is Kilmacud your absolute number one club now over anyone else I know Anybody. if they were playing at loan I'd, I'd be supporting at loan ah, no well, that's all, that's all, all no that membership that. stuff all, all there's the, no the question about that they mean no so much about to me it. and it was like ah but when it really comes no, to it no of course that, well, that, that, that's, that's, of, that, that would be ludicrous that I would support against well, the club it's ludicrous to me that you're not supporting a Westmead club the Downs who haven't been there for 50 years you're just saying that to get a reaction I'm not at all I'm just wondering your thinking behind it hypothetically I can't even see you over there for the and how quickly how quickly your loyalties change just like that let's say you're a player now Adrian for Kilmacud and you just draw Athlone in the Leinster like Championship the event, game. Yeah. The, 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 oh, this is a massive <laughs> hypothetical. Uh, you'd, you'd line out happily Seething for. You. You'd happily line out for Kilmacud against against Athlone. If I committed to playing for Crokes, then of course. So I could, like, I sure, there are examples of this everywhere. It's not like I wouldn't be the first person to have ever done this. This is like happens have all the clubs. time you have two in every sport. You can have two clubs. You can you don't need to be dictated to by anybody, Shane. You can have as many bloody clubs as you want. Do you kill McCode, Athlone, half and half scarf. It's not a bad idea. So I do think, I, I'm I do not think as outraged cr- by the half and half thing as most people, to be honest. But I do think it's crazy you're ruling out playing for a Dublin club. Just think about it. You prolong I, your career. I train with them. I just think it's crazy. Would you be disowned, or was, is it your own sense no, of loyalty? It's my own sense of loyalty to, my, to the town. Um, I've j- got the 047 tattooed on my wrist. It's, it's, it, by the way, I have to say, this is a conversation that we need to come back to someone because that is, <laughs> of, 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 in the ludicrous things you've said this week, Shane, that is, that is pushing for number one. Up my um, Jim Sullivan says that, Shane, uh, are you freezing in your tidy black t shirt? Uh, I'm actually lovely and warm. The studio is actually a nice temperature this it's morning. It's toasty, yeah. Thanks for pointing out the tidy, white, uh, the tidy black t shirt. It's, yeah, it is a bit tight, isn't it? But sure, look. It's toasty here. Fashion 101 um, this morning. And um, on the same note, uh, didn't know you covered breakdancing lads, says Greg London, which reference, is a reference to the comment to yourself there, Colm. Here's an answer to a question you haven't asked. Melbourne 2014, that's where I got it, the Australian Open. I, nobody asked it, nobody yeah, cares. I'm just saying, I'm just, uh, you might have thought I, I bought it especially for you this week. Um, we've a minute and a half now, so... This slot probably this is we're, we're rebooting last. It was so successful last. It was week. so successful. The numbers were so big, Shane. Give the people what they want. Oh, I just have a few. Um, I just have a few. List thoughts. here as long as your arm. Go on. I just have a few thoughts. Colin's highlights week. from the. You pitched it last week that you know you hadn't been on since the World Cup started. Now I don't know what your pitch here is, but go on, get into no, it. No, I'm anyway. just continuing my work. It's just during the what World Cup. It? This will happen, really. What is it? So I have a few thoughts. I've, I've written them down here. Um, so when a player when a player scores a goal at the World Cup, right? Uh, what instantly happens underneath their name is that their World Cup stats for their entire World Cup lifetime is given. So, i.e. Ronaldo has scored five goals in his entire World Cup career. But what I want to know is how many World Cup goals they've scored in this tournament. Mm. I want to know who the top scorer in this tournament is. Yeah. So just a little pet peeve there with FIFA. Don't know what you think on that. By the way, at any moment here you can just stop me if you want to chime in. But sure. I, 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 if, no, no, if anything interesting comes up, we'll... <laughs> I wouldn't I like quite... FIFA to get something wrong, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Conchalo Ramos, the new superstar of uh, world football, now 21-year-old Portuguese sensation up front. Um, his third goal, the little dink finish. Mm. Was that just invented about a decade ago? I don't remember dink one-on-one finishes in the 90s or the noughties. So when the ball's getting away from you, Nani was a big purveyor of them from Manchester United. Tough skill. You're about to, you're about to flick it either side of the goalkeeper and instead you dink it. I think that's a relish, relatively new phenomenon in football, open to correction on yeah. that. Well, I'd like to see more of it, including the scoop the scoop goal. Oh, uh, Bubakar. <coughs> yeah, Bubakar. Oh, I'd have more well, scoops. Well, uh, Carl Poparski did that at Euro 96. I'm always up for more scoops. Yeah. <laughs> um, ice cream. Ramos' first goal that game. 
the left footed shot uh, top oh, of the fantastic uh, that'll be that's the uh, open play goal of the tournament for me so far oh that would be uh, we from that. Uh, here's a question for you which will be more aesthetically pleasing today uh, jersey wise Brazil versus Croatia or the Netherlands versus Argentina Oh, the Netherlands, Argentina. Oh, I'd probably go with that, yeah. Old school, really? 70 yet, yeah. Croatia, are we saying Croatia's nice? It'll be the blue, won't it? Or will it be the, the red and white today? Red and um, white versus the yellow? Or red, oh, red and white versus yellow, surely. Will it be? So, yeah. oh, there's enough contrast there, surely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Think we'll see. Right, also, come on, get a move on. Yeah, I know, Ronan's waiting, yeah. yeah. Um, well, they just haven't changed their jersey in so long, so it's always the same. Uh, Portugal's Octavia is my favourite player of the World Cup. Love watching him. Right. Creative midfielder, plays for Porto. Hope to see him in a Premier League near you G- soon. Hipster They're jacket, hipster player. Very, very good player. Yeah. Really, really like him now. Uh, obviously, Portugal look much better without Ronaldo. Uh, here's a question for you. When the goalkeeper jumps off the line for a penalty and the referee says, no, you have to retake it uh, because you're off your line, would that, in theory, just keep on going eternally? No, the forever? keeper would stop doing it after two Why after would the keeper... Goals, it's natural for the keeper to jump out, so would the ref they, just they, be like, I'll just leave it? They'd probably book them at a certain point. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's the question. At a certain point, mm. not really sure about that. Uh, just one as well. Um, the Netflix documentary series "Pepsi Where's My Jet" is a very hit, much hidden gem. If anybody's looking for something to watch this weekend, What's "Pepsi this Where's My Jet." You, you mentioned this yesterday to me off air, and What's I was like, "What is this?" Like? I, you've got to watch it. Honestly, it's about a guy who wins a, a Harrier jet from Pepsi. It's very, very good. There are my thoughts. Right. I actually have more, but I leave it because Ronan O'Gara is looking at me right um, now, and I want him to look at G. Michael says Clannagale is a great club. A lot of rural players and students from Trinity train there, so just uh, turn up in January for training. Maybe wear a different tracksuit top, which is the best bit of advice I think you're going to get. Thanks this very morning. much. That's helpful. Thank Happy you. birthday to you. Oh, thanks Happy very birthday, much. Column, yeah. Thanks, Good guys. Good man. Thanks, well, done. well done. Hope the weekend uh, picks up for you. Um, we've loads coming a little later on. Alan Quinlan's going to get stuck into the meat and drink at the uh, Heineken Cup. We'll preview all those games. We're going to have Kevin Caban. who will be live from the World Cup. So uh, we're chatting to him um, about uh, some of those. None of the stuff that uh, Colm has brought up there, but some more interesting talking points. So we'll get to him um, on that. We'll have Morris Deegan in the studio as well a bit later on um, on his retirement from intercounty refereeing. So loads still to come. But before all of that, uh, it is 7.52. It's Friday morning. Uh, delighted you could join us this morning. Do keep those comments flying into us. Ronan Agara, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, how are you, guys. How are you keeping? Very well. Very well. Yourselves? Good. A nice quiet few weeks for you. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I've had a bit of time off this morning for the first time in a, in a while. So I didn't do the school run. So a little change of routine is good. Um uh, to regather the thoughts before we go again tomorrow. So yeah, it has been. Uh, yeah, um, I suppose you get periods like that every maybe three years, four years, two years, depending on when I suppose uh, contract um, will come up for uh, renewal. It's different to the playing game. Obviously, the coaching game it probably happens a year in advance, uh, and then obviously there was um, disciplinary. Um, problems so um, yeah never a dull moment never a dull moment what what a few weeks what when you get all that sorted Ronan are you, um, can you talk to us a little bit about it or give us some sort of an insight because like you know from the outside looking in all you ever see is the press release and the quotes that come out and you have no sense of what's going on behind the back back end so um, when it all gets done are you uh, is that something you celebrate like what's the after media's aftermath of getting pen on paper no, like that. That's I suppose where it, it differs. That from everybody else is just it's it's um, something. This is stating the obvious. Obviously, you're signing a, a paper, but it, it it means very very little in the fact that you I mean there's a rule in France four defeats in a row and you're gone. You know, so. Um, well, people will say, oh, well, yeah, but he has a contract and the payout will be different. But it becomes very complicated if you look at it like that. And obviously, I've started on the negative side where uh, I don't envisage that happening. Um, but, um, you know, you probably uh, had to weigh up in terms of the test game. Um, the test game is something that I would like to do. Um, but... I just still felt at 45 that I have plenty of time to do that. Um, and I think um, when you want to create an environment where you are successful, I think it's a process as opposed to uh, words. So my acts and my behaviours and my what I do, my behaviour is important. So I've assembled a squad here. 
And it was the same when I was a player at Munster. I had offers to leave as a player, but if your number 10 is jumping ship, I think it's a, it's a kick in the stomach for, for the organisation. Here, I suppose the president and the sporting director have let me kind of target players I want to target, keep players I want to, I want to keep. And um, that's very exciting, Adrian, in mm. the fact that you can create your group and, and your and your squad. But it's, it's only just happened last season, I think. The more you reflect what was pulled off in Marseille would be... Uh, an outlier in the fact that the environment and the, probably the uh, where Leinster are, they'd be ahead of where 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 we are. But that's exciting in its own right. It means that our upside is probably bigger. Mm. So, um, you know, I think signing the the contract is one thing. Committing to it is is another thing. But like, you can't be in two places at the one time. Mm. You know, in an ideal world, you'd love to coach. Um, La Rochelle and then have a test team but you'd find yourself <laughs> burnt out pretty quickly did you, did you I hadn't never even considered that well, you you weren't thinking about that were you? no you can't do that no. obviously no 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 no. it's full time jobs both of them and it's pretty difficult to do one, one as it is but uh, I love it and uh, as you know uh, from having visited over the summer uh, there are six people very happy here and that's excluding me, and I think that's the most important thing. It's it's a career that if if uh, you were to neglect, I suppose, the non-rugby side, you could end, just end up very easily in a one-bed apartment anywhere in the world because you the game can eat you and the uh, needs of the game can eat you. But for me, there's nothing more important than, than family, and, and that was... Uh, a crucial part of the decision, you know, when you sit around the table, uh, when six hands go up, who wants to stay? <laughs> it's it's pretty convincing, and it's a memory that that will stay with me. Is that that literally happen? Yeah, because like you know, that's it's no different to any other family. People think that rugby players or soccer players are different, but it's it, it's not. You know, it's it's very privileged to play in front of packed houses, and and that's what happens in La Rochelle. It's obviously diluted from top sporting, not top sporting, but soccer, where you can have 80, 100,000 people at games. The capacity here is 16,000, is full every week. But from that point of view, it's very uh, pleasing to have that kind of privilege. Uh, but like that affects one person, and then behind that, you're you're trying to get do what's best for your family, and what's best for your family is living in a in a nice place where hopefully they can um, get their needs looked after as well. We kind of spoke to you on different occasions, Ronan, on the show about the the, the England rumours and depending on who you listen to, the, you were on a, a short list of three or four. Um, like was, the, was the contract with La Rochelle always kind of scheduled to happen around now or did the England rumour mill, I guess, speed that whole process along? No, it didn't. It was always. See, that's, as I said to you, like I'm consistent in that and the fact that it's, uh, I'd be out of contract at the end of 24, you know, so they want to have their business done before Christmas because um, um, by that it gives them uh, six months. If I was leaving on the last um, year of the contract, then they'd have to have someone in place because um, it's so easy to find someone, but finding someone isn't really what the name of the game is. They're trying to find someone that's either better than you or hopefully as good as you. So it's a, it's a very important, I suppose, position to, to fill. So um, the, no, the England, um, I suppose, um, opportunity or potential opportunity w w was in the background. And, um, you know, I think I always had a realistic view and I, I, I put myself... Um, in the position where if there was the Irish job and um, Steve Bartwick was picked ahead of me, I probably have um, feel very frustrated and disappointed with that. And when you flip it on its head, uh, Ron Rogara versus Steve Bartwick in England, I think he has an advantage over me. So I always felt I was probably the outsider of three in that race. Uh, but that's okay. That's that you don't know because. Uh, 
you know, you, you it's only when you probably, I suppose, um, have briefings with them and feedback from them and get into interesting conversations and dialogue. Maybe that's their vision is is more similar to yours. So it's it's a it was a um, I suppose a, a period where I enjoyed. Um, you mean placing myself in a in a, a test manager's tracksuit, uh, and that's what you you have to do. Um, when you say the the background in terms of your conversation, there, there were conversations with the RFU with the RFU. There was a um, a process uh, on, ongoing. Is that fair enough to say? The process is probably advanced. There was conversations with with, with certain. Um, members of the RFU and um, it wasn't uh, a decision won't be made till I would say well it's obviously changed now because this was pre uh, Eddie Jones mm. where so everything is different and I'm out of the loop so um, I'm not too sure what's going to happen now obviously but something that at some point or another uh, an itch you'll want to scratch the, the international thing wherever, wherever that may be yeah, well, obviously, you'd love to. You, you know, you'd love to coach. But the obvious solution is is Ireland, but uh, there's no availability there, and and that's for a good reason because Andy Farrell is, is humming, and he's got his team playing great rugby, and he's got a great environment. So, but you mean that's that's okay if that was. It would be nice to happen at some stage, be it in four years, ten years. I don't know. I'd like to do it. I'm a competitor. I'd like to try and see what I could do with an Irish team at a certain stage. Uh, but I think also when you when you coach, um, there's something inside you where you're able to strip back, I think, the emotion and the attachment or the, um, the, the role is very visible, irrespective of, of what country... Um, you are coaching, so it becomes a very, I suppose, um, appealing position to me anyway in the fact that you could uh, be the boss of a certain country to try and get the best out of the rugby players available in a certain country. It's professional coaching. Are you someone, Ronan, who, who sets out a, <clears throat> a rough timeline for yourself? Like, by this year, I want to, you know, I'd love to be involved in Munster if there was an opportunity, or Ireland if there was an opportunity, or do you just kind of, I guess, take it as it comes? Yeah, well, I wouldn't be mapping out that. <laughs> it's not, um, you mean, to coach Munster. No, that's not the plan. Uh, the plan is to to obviously commit here, do as well as I can, and then uh, it may change again, but maybe have a look at, um, can I do something at test level? That That's, for me, the natural evolution of this. But in terms of, setting goals um, I have a simple answer and that is you're trying to get the best out of yourself and your team on a daily basis and, and, and that's quite challenging I, no, I don't believe in I know I probably have a vision where I want to go to but I don't set out goals because I'm a believer in that I don't know my limit I don't think my team knows its limit so why put a limit on it um, one last one for me, and, and like the happy thing aside of the contract is now we don't have to ask you about this uh, for the next while, right? So, <laughs> so bear with me on one more of it. The the monster point, um, I'm surprised to hear you saying that it's not on some level on the radar. Is that um, like do, do you see yourself as being monster coach at any point? Hypothetically, very hypothetical question. Um, I don't know. Genuinely, I don't know, um, but. Um, you mean you can be sure that um, coaching Ireland would appeal more than coaching Munster? That's for certain. Um, I've kind of coached in the club game. I think you find exactly what Razor is doing. He's coached the Crusaders. I don't think he wants to coach a club team. He wants to coach a test team. And I think when you're in our positions, it's very understandable why that would be. Uh, Munster's a great club, with great people. Uh, I have great memories as a player evolve um, I'm not too sure um, if that will happen in the medium short term future um, but uh, 
I mean, there's a special place there uh, in my heart for, for, for Munster, but um, it's it's not on the on the short term plan. That's for sure. All right. Unlikely, but never say never. I think is uh, maybe Correct. the takeaway from that. What uh, Scott yeah. Robertson you mentioned there? What tell us? The I was interested to read your piece in the Examiner this morning. A really good point made about the links with Leinster that it's unlikely as a replace a uh, direct like for like uh, for Stuart Lancaster. Is is uh, your opinion or your thoughts as to whether because you said there he probably wouldn't leave for another club gig? Is that unlikely to happen in in whatever role? Do you think or? Um, yeah, I think so. I think he's had his fillet of. From talking to him, and I could be wrong, but my impression from speaking to him is that he's he's ready for the test game. He's ready for the test arena. He'd obviously um, once at uh, at all cost to coach the uh, the All Blacks. Whether that will happen after this World Cup cycle, I don't know. And when that will happen in terms of their announcement is probably more crucial because it blocks him for other potential jobs. So. He's probably in a in a waiting hold at the minute, getting uh, getting frustrated in the fact that um, he wants to know, I suppose, what his next move is. But he's not in control of that. Mm. Uh, tell him to come over here, do the Joe Schmidt thing. Come on over here, give us your goodness for a few years, build up your CV. You know, win a couple of hiding cups with Leinster run is what I'm saying here, and then uh, you know we can return him back to the All Blacks gig. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could send them to Munster too. Yeah, uh, that's true. That is true. That is true. Um, your your frustrations with the ten week ban were again very evident from the uh, examiner column this morning. You, as you say yourself, uh, two down, eight uh, to go in terms of the weeks. Big frustration for you, I'm sure, because we've chatted to you about it before. Some of that is to do with your own uh, responsibilities around it, but also in terms of the general process of how it's all come about. Yeah, it is very very damaging to the team and the fact that game day you're you're um you can't have a role you know it has a big impact and you see it more and more uh, and it's a, obviously the the crucial two two months uh in december january where everything is more or less decided from times of push for qualification or else scrapping for for places so um you know, I, I'm not going to say anything more and just say my choice of words were, were very, very poor. But um, the time doesn't fit the crime. Yeah. Do you, find, do you find that as a head coach, I guess you get, you almost get punished more so than, than if you were a player? That almost they're trying to set an example by, you know, Sending a, a message, I guess, in some ways. No, but sure, they've sent me messages already. It's just the fact that in this case, I was um, um, I was of the opinion that it was a, a private conversation, which it wasn't. With the disciplinary people? Uh, with the head of the referees in France. So mm. communication had been established for for a number of years yet um my wording pushed him over the 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 line to to report me and as a result i received a 10-week a ban so when you're saying that when you're saying the punishment didn't fit the crime and that obviously don't want to land you in trouble um but like I, 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 was there a precedent for it like was there any was there a period of ban which maybe you were expecting compared to the 10 weeks? No, because I think it's a unique case. So it was very much the first. And there was other, I suppose, um, well, you can't call them similar cases when, when the official process is respected. But there has been other, I suppose, coaches who have gone the, the public route to, to highlight. Um, in, what's the word? inaccuracies or inconsistencies in the game but um, you know I mean I was quite confident when um, Razi Erasmus got two weeks uh, so yeah to, to open an email to see 10 week ban was, was shattering and uh, obviously you don't want to become the bet noir as well and, and suddenly get painted with that brush that you're some sort of a troublemaker which uh, which uh, Well I'm already there, you know, it's that the the guy is difficult, he's 
a bit of a maniac, a lunatic, uh, a hothead. You know, they've they've gone hard the last few weeks. Yeah, most definitely on, on, in the press. Uh, but um, you know, I mean, thankfully you'd have a, a team and a club that would probably have my back. And other players that I've coached in France have been quite supportive. But but yeah, it's been unrelenting. Um, so because they always go to the kind of you know what I mean, the one or two or three um, sour apples that you had previously caused that probably didn't like your your <laughs> uh, uh, management skills <laughs> to, to, to give the fire plenty of oxygen, but that's okay. Uh, Heineken Cup obviously back this weekend, uh, Northampton La Rochelle Saturday evening, then you've Ulster back to back, you're going in as champions. What's the hunger like for Europe this season? Um... When we're not going in as champions, we're that's over. I think I have to make that very clear that once tomorrow comes around, there's no champions. It's a new competition. We start from zero, and we're looking forward to it. We've got a good team. We'll be at home, and we want to start fast. And uh, we love this competition. Um, it's reunited, or not reunited, but it uh, it gave I think special feeling to, to the town of La Rochelle last May, scenes in the port that have been rarely seen anywhere in the world, so if you don't get a buzz out of that, you're, you're in the wrong game, and uh, that will live with us for the rest of our lives, but we got to um, reload now and and um, have another crack off it with a different group of players, a lot of new signings, Antoine Astois and Cantin. La Souk, well, it's their first games in the Champions Cup for people in Ireland. They'll find that fascinating, you know, the fact that it's our bread and butter back in Ireland. Uh, but over in France, it just shows, I suppose, um, the difference in stages of development between Irish teams and French teams. I guess on a, on a lighter note, Ronan, how do you how do you find the build-up to Christmas then? Like we were chatting on the show yesterday about Colchis Christmas. When all the coaches come into Dublin and, and do their shopping, I don't know if you consider yourself a culture or you have a part or you get to partake in France. No, um, that's the eighth of December, is it? it all, is. all day, all day, the, uh, the brown shoes. Giving away whether you're a culture or not with that response, Ronan. There's no getting away from it now. I'm a hundred percent a culture yeah. from Cork. Um, so um, you'd wear the brown shoes and the checkered shirts and the, the Budweiser belt buckles and all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, there are people who think like that, isn't it? How dare they come into our city like that? <laughs> but spend all your money. It's like, <laughs> yeah. give, give us that culture good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully get home for Christmas this year. Hopefully. By law, we have to have four days consecutively off. So it falls well. We play Bordeaux 23rd at... 6.45, so I might get home 24, 25th, 26th. Oh, that's good. Well, either way, Santa comes to France and, and Ireland, and yeah. rest assured, so safe enough. Père Noël. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's a topic in itself. It's a, an interesting um, debate in our house with the ages, you know. Oh, of course. What a, you know, that's very, very complicated. What <laughs> age is What age is too young to know about Santa, you know? I in my experience, like just keep it going for as long as you can. That's uh, <laughs> that's what you got to do. Yeah, there's nasty, nasty guys in the schoolyard at six over here. Right, young oh, geez, that's very young. Um, <laughs> we're walking a fine line here, so I'm conscious of that. Um, come here, congrats on the on the contract. Guess look over the weekend. Thanks a million. Good to chat with you. Yeah, cheers, lads. Good luck. Take care. Ronan on the line there, Ronan Agar on the line from uh, La Rochelle. Interesting stuff as always as to how it's all come about. His ambitions were down the track. It's mm. certainly interesting that uh, the Munster thing is clearly not. I'm sure there's plenty of Munster fans out there that will be disappointed by those remarks. Yeah, not on the radar, it seems. Of course, as he says, anything anything can happen down the line. Um, things can change over over time. But yeah, certainly the test. Ireland is the... Mm. And I think everyone in the country wants to see that happen at some point. Yeah. Like, well, even if it is in four years' time after this contract. But... Um, once the job and opportunity is there for Ronan, I think it'll be obvious when the time arises. He's, that, in, that he's, he's in an amazing position. Yeah. He's in an unbelievable position. He's sat back. He's been courted by, like, the England job would be, um, I mean, the All Blacks gig might be the best gig in, in, in the game, bar none. Yeah. Um, but for Ronan, is, the Irish gig but, is top but dollar. The England gig wouldn't be far off. It. It's nice to be sat back and having that attention 
poured upon you and people saying nice things about you, you couldn't be but flattered about it. <laughs> but like he said himself, the setup he has there is sensational. He's obviously got a big young family who are very settled, who's like um, French is their first language. They're mm. never when they when when they get asked around the table, what do you want to do here? I'm not surprised that all the hands go up as to yeah, the same put. Of course, so listen, it was it was a no brainer in, in many ways, and it's worked out for Ronan. Do you know all the, the I don't, like as I said, the, the rumor mill might not have con- contributed in any way to the contract, but. Um, it's a good deal. Won't have for, helped. Yeah, well, well, sorry, it won't have hindered. Yeah, 100%. I'm, I'm really getting my expressions wrong this 100%. morning. Competition time on OTB AM. Uh, the Leopardstown Christmas Festival will take place December 26th to 29th. And it's a brilliant day out for sporting fans, socialites, and thrill seekers alike. Every day this week, we've had uh, two hospitality pla- uh, places for the Leopardstown Pavilion to give away. And you're going to get a reserve table, you get lunch, you get chat and tips from a top tipster, and plenty more as well. Besides, to enter all of that, simply comment with a Christmas tree emoji this morning, a Christmas tree emoji on our main Twitter page add off the ball and you're automatically in the hat remember to ensure that uh, your DMs are open so we can hit you up to let you know that you've won and that's how we'll contact you at the Leopardstown Christmas Festival uh, Festival. it's December 26th to the 29th tickets are from €35 Euro. they're available at leopardstown.com now during the ad break Nathan uh, Murphy will take on Jerry Gilroy in FIFA it's all part of the OTB Games Room which is a partnership with Virgin Media bring your A game with 99.9% broadband reliability after the break um, speaking of people who've had lots of nice things been said about them, Kevin Kilban is going to join us live from the World Cup. See you then. Santa's coming in town. Santa! Oh my God! Santa here? Oh, oh, I know him. Let it snow. Let it snow. You're listening to OTB Sports Radio. Who is this serving? And what is the end goal? It would be kind of nice to know. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports. I feel like we haven't had quite enough Irish bias this year, so I am quite happy to see this. Yeah. They were awesome. It's true what Emma Carroll said. Liverpool are coming into their own, right? Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. So, Joe, when was the last time you played FIFA? 2002. Okay. When was the last time you played? I was more pro evil, man. Oh, time? Andy Lyons. Andy Lyons. Oh! Miles off. This is ridiculous. Wow, wow, look at that. What's up? I didn't know you could be offside. Oh, get it, get it, get it. The tackle button. I'm trying to figure that out. Oh, go on, go on. Uh, oh, I need a bit more power. Come on, Gary O'Neill. Oh, no. Great tackle. And again, and again, and again. Oh, big save. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. It's nearly 20 past eight. You're watching OTB AM. Kevin Kilban, come on in. Good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian. How are you getting on? Are you uh, itching to get home now or are you just enjoying the football too much for any of that? I was itching to, to get home the day I arrived. I have to say that honestly, I think I had that. You know, I had the conversation before I left. I, I was nervous about actually coming over here, and that's not really left me since I've arrived here. Honestly, I've loved the football, and it's been great doing the games and going to games here and there. But no, I, I, I'm, yeah, I've become a, become a softie. Yeah, I, I, I have, really do. You have to say that now, yeah. you're obliged by marital contract, Kev, to say that either way. <laughs> I might. Well, well, I don't. I don't think. I don't think my wife's going to see this. Really, is she? So she's not um, a big OTA, and, OTBAM viewer, no. <laughs> well, no, she's a big fan of Agent Barry, but not not necessarily the show, you know, because you, you're global <laughs> these days, you know. Of course, of course. What's your uh, What's your itinerary on a, the last few days off? What do you get up to? Um, what we got on? Well, we have. Um, Obviously, we had the the games over the next two days, and then we're back into the, the couple of days off. Even though there's actually been a media game arranged, I was just talking to to, to the fellow from court there before I came on. What's you his know? name? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I was talking to Colin. Um, 
But anyway, no, we um, we had this media game arranged. So you had to put your name down before the tournament started to, to go and play in this media game. And it was the world's media. So everybody from every organisation get the chance to play in a game. And it's at one of the stadiums. I'm not too sure which, which stadium it's actually at. So anyway, we all put our name down. We, we got off and it went, yeah, we'll play, no problems. And then the game, I think, so Monday, I think it is. And then we got an email yesterday to say, only one player or one person from the whole team gets to play in it. And you can put a reserve guy on standby in case we need to call them up last minute. And we were like, ah, get out of it. No way. <laughs> can you imagine sending that to ITV with Roy and all that? <laughs> yeah. they, they, they desperately want all of it. So we just said, nah, we'll leave it. Thanks very much, but no thanks. You didn't get an invite to the... So that's it. You didn't get an invite to the big game then, obviously, the, the clip that's gone gone viral. Uh, no, I saw the clip actually. Yeah, no, no, we didn't get invited. Why, why would I? Why would I? Well, I mean, what did you think of the the celebration from Roy? A bit over the top, I thought. Like, yeah, uh, th- that's his very, job very, essentially to score. Is that is that very un Roy? I very. think I th- I th- we were talking about it in the news round last night, and it suddenly dawned on me that he was it was a commentary on the Brazil celebrations mm. and his comments about that. Yeah. Maybe. But he didn't have the dance at the end, though. He needed the dance, didn't we? <laughs> he jumped the wheelie bin and said, "Have you? You haven't bumped into him, have you?" <laughs> No, no, not at all. No, it's been it's been fairly low key, really. I, I think I'd said to you, we our hotel, like I'd said to you, we're staying in the same hotel as Brazil. It's, it's a little bit out of the way, but we have a one of the metro stops, which is a couple of five minute walks, say, down the road from us. We hop on the metro, usually in and out to to where the studios are, and unless we're going to a game where we just hop on the metro again, we've been fairly isolated, really. So that's been pretty much it. Yeah, um, like as former teammates, you're not saying, "Oh, we must catch up for a must catch up for a cup of tea." No, there's been a few of the guys. Um, Dion Dublin was on to me. Um, I haven't had the chance to meet up with Dion yet, but Dion was on to me. A couple of the guys that I'd spoken to, a few of the guys that I would have done stuff with when I when I was working at the BBC uh, were on to me, and I, I kind of bumped into. I actually did bump into Dion one night, but I didn't. It, it was when I was walking back from after, after the games. I think those the apartments at the BBC are, are actually staying and are not too far from where we are. Uh, the famous BBC um, apartments, I should say. Yeah, but um, so we 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 bumped hmm. into them, uh, a couple of the guys who I would have worked with, and that was pretty much it. So I, I said we'd meet up along the way, but we've we've just not had a chance to, and, and they haven't either because. I know you're not really necessarily doing lots of travel to get to the games like it would have been at any other World Cup, but. It's just getting that chance on a night off or something when, you know what it's like, you just kind of get your work done in the day and then you, you get out for a bit of dinner in the evening and that's kind of it. I met Dan McDonnell actually, you know, I met Dan a couple of nights ago, so we went out and had a bit of food and, and he's he's uh, someone who I did meet, yeah, so we, we had, I had a few hours with Dan which was nice. I remember seeing Dan's tweet I think at the start of the tournament where like the, the height of the nightlife in, in Doha seems to be these 24-hour coffee uh, shops so that's probably the the only chance you get to kind of meet up with people yeah. I guess is you, shisha the shisha yeah she, shisha bars there's a, lot, there's a lot of shisha bars knocking around and coffee bars yeah um, you're very selective if you want to go and you want to go and find a beer and things like that more, more often than not you have to go into into certain hotels which you kind of want to stroll around don't you you want to just maybe have a have a the souk um, the, the souk Wakif, which is by us which is kind of the marketplace that big marketplace near our studios it's a great little walk actually around and you get a bit of a feel a little bit for the place there but you, you can't get a drink or anything there so it's just it's it's a nice chill out it's a nice chill out place to be honest with you would you be partial to a bit of shisha no, no, I wouldn't be a shisha man. Actually, I've I've had it in the past, but no, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be my cup of tea. No, it wouldn't be shisha. I can imagine a man like yourself would be very uh, very worldly and things like that. You'd be all over it, but no, it wouldn't be my cup of tea. No, <laughs> come here. The uh, you gave us a nugget, obviously, in the last round, and uh, the clip has gone viral since. And uh, you've been retweeting it yourself, which of course is uh, self praise, Kev. Which we'd be we'd be all too familiar with your uh, in your. Oh account. no, I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> I didn't want to talk, about, want to talk you know. about it. <laughs> Top of the agenda. The only thing you wanted to talk about this morning. You gave us a nugget. You gave us a nugget. Let's be fair. Let's be fair. You gave us a nugget. You called Morocco to beat Spain. So, Mr. Kilban looking into his uh, crystal ball here for the quarterfinals. Any surprises on the cards? Uh, I'm just actually going through. I'm just like I'm. Uh, I started yesterday just getting through everything, looking through clips, or trying to do analysis on. Um, the Holland Argentina game and the Brazil Croatia game tonight. So we're just trying to get everything together from it. I. I I mean, I don't think there'll be a shock in the Brazil game. I think Brazil will beat Croatia. I thought Croatia looked so tired in the Japan match, particularly maybe the last 20 minutes. And if you look at Croatia, I think seven of the last eight um, 
competitive or, or um, sorry tournament games. I've, I've gone to in, I've gone to in extra time, should I say? So I, I just don't see them being able to muster up another big performance and take the game to to extra time and beat Brazil. I can't see that happening. So Brazil, I think, handily enough. Today's other one, I think Netherlands will beat Argentina. I think um, I think the setup for is is that a shock? Is that uh, a shock? I think so. Guys, yeah. I Please don't be so. Yeah. I think I think uh, Argentina uh, will be will be favourites for it, but yeah. Man for man, I think Holland are better. Honestly, do if you look look through look through the sides and look through. I think defensively Holland are better. Um, even in midfield, I would probably say there's a lot of energy in in that Argentine side. Um, I don't think it's going to be a great game. I don't think it's going to be one that we're going to look back on and think that was a classic match. But I just fancy I fancy Netherlands to win it. I just think they're going to. I think I think it might be tight, one nil, maybe two one. Right, I can't. If it goes to if it goes to extra time, I wouldn't be surprised. And then penalties, who knows? Um, then you're looking at a fifty fifty call on that one. And I, I think it will be that tight. But I just I just side with Netherlands. Yeah, just I think they'll do it. Yeah, Louis van Gaal has been the the man of the tournament for me so far, Kev. Like the, even yesterday, yeah. being asked about the Angel Di Maria called him the worst coach he ever had, and he replied with yeah. uh, Memphis Depay in the room saying, you know, I used to bench Memphis at Old Trafford, and now we kiss. On the yeah. mouth, and uh, Memphis losing his losing his head <laughs> a bit uncontrollably. Yeah. Like he, he's been a, we always knew he was, he was a character. Um, someone you might have liked to have played under yourself. Um, I, I, my my early memories of Van Gaal are probably from that game in in all one that we played against, or the two games mm. actually we played against them because mm. one of the best performances that that we would have put in in it, during that campaign actually was when we went to Amsterdam. We we were so good. We we ended up drawing the game to a piece, but we. We were brilliant for 70 minutes, I would say. Maybe even long. We, we played well. And it was a worldie from Van Bronckhorst, I think, that got them back in the game. And then they ended up draw, tying the game up or whatever it was. But after that game, he was kind of disrespectful to us. It was more or less saying that we were a bunch of pub players or something like that. It, it, I can't remember the exact words, but it, which is probably true, as it turns out. But... Um, <laughs> He, I always all. felt like, oh, what an arrogant, you know, arrogant. And I think we felt a bit like that. But I don't think we ever really appreciated his personality, I think, within that side. And over the years, even when he was at Man United, I used to quite like him. And, you know, watching the team play, I don't think they were a great watch. I think we all brutal. accepted that watching Man United. Yeah, they were a brutal watch. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I think there's been a bit of criticism levelled at him during this tournament. Remember the Senegal, the Ecuador games? They, were, they weren't great games to watch. And then they just, well, they, they just did a job on the USA in that last 16 game. And I, I actually fancied that to happen too. I thought USA don't, don't have anything up front that, that was ever going to trouble um, the Dutch. So I fancied them to do that. So his personality is really shining through. And I think that, you know, obviously he's had he's had an illness and there's been tragedy in his family as well over the years as well with, with, with illness to cancer. So I think he's just just in uh, savouring every moment mm. of it, just thinking, look, you know, let, let's enjoy it. And I think, you know, I, he always, when you talk to older coaches, just older people as they, as they get on, maybe even through career, as I would look back on it as well, you never really had the chance to savour those those moments, those big moments in, in, in your playing career. And I think he recognises he's had so many big moments across his career. This is almost like my swan song. I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. And He's been great to listen to. I think he's been even that video after the last sixteen when they came back after the, after they beat USA. It was great just watching him coming back into the hotel, dancing with his mobile yeah. phone, sav- savoring that moment. And was it one of you guys saying to me the other day that there's he sold his his rights to to Netflix or something? There's going to be a, there's going to be a movie on his life or something like that. I, I heard that somewhere, which would be great in itself. Watching watching that story if there were to be one on, on Van Gaal. But um, I just think he's. He, He's been great to listen to. That's the thing. Every press conference has been something and a quote, a throwaway quote that he's that he's thrown out that has gone almost viral because he's he he obviously is very funny and I think the lads love him for that reason. I think they can really warm to him. Um, so yeah, I've I've loved watching him. I've loved watching him and I've loved seeing his sides and I think I think they'll beat Argentina today. Yeah, that, that's um, I it, like it is hard to know where Argentina are at. They were nearly caught by Australia, obviously the last day. Um, the only obviously with with the with the Dutch, they they're happy for the opposition to have the ball, which maybe works mm. up to a point against some of the lesser sides. But you're feeling that even mm. even with a team the quality of Argentina and their ability to get goals, well, that that might not even be a problem. No, I, I actually disagree with that, Adrian, we say against the lesser teams because that, that sort of tactic doesn't really work against the lesser teams because they don't want the ball. So they're almost giving it you back and you've got to do mm. something. It works against the better teams. I've I've seen a lot of Holland in 
in qualification. So I was actually doing a lot of analysis on how how they actually do play. And it's not so much they let you have the ball, they let you have the ball in your own half. So it would have been something that, that I would have been very familiar with when I was playing, where let the centre-halves have the ball, let, let them step in a little bit. And if you watch them, they kind of almost give you a pass into midfield, which I'm sure that Argentina will take at times. And if they're giving the ball to Messi, Messi could beat two players quickly if that pass is is given to him. But they try and press that first pass. And what they do when they win, if they win the ball from from that press in, in the midfield, they break from it. Watch Gakpo and watch um, Memphis from it. Even watch Klassen if he's playing today or whoever it will be that'll be playing as a ten. They immediately spring from that pass when De Jong or uh, De Roon or Coop Miners, whoever it's going to be that that, that are playing on that press, they break off it. And three or four lads get beyond the ball immediately, and it's so hard to stop. And they have a great way of playing. Look, look how the the they're, they're so good in the wider areas. Daily Blint. I mean, he, he couldn't run 10 years ago. Everyone would know him from Man United. He couldn't run, but you would really ever see... He, he reminds me dearly blint of Kenny Cunningham. And, that, and, and you know, maybe trying to be respectful to Kenny as well within that. Kenny wasn't the quickest player, but Kenny had a reading of the game that was as good as anyone I played alongside, where he was in the place before you actually got the ball, so we take it off you. He never got exposed, and Daley Blint exactly like that. He, he gets himself in position, wins the ball... And he's always in the attacking third. He's always putting balls into the area. You look at the cross that he put in for Dumfries' goal in the last game. He obviously got the goal off the back of the Dum- Dumfries cross in that UA- USA game. The way they exploit wide, er- wide areas is is great to see. So just watch how many bodies the forward they get off, off a counter. It's five bodies quickly forward. And that's where the chances come from. And I saw a lot of the goals that I that were trying to analyse in, in qualification that, that came from situations like that, giving you that ball into midfield, quick press, and then how they break off it. I mean, I'm sure that like Stephen Kenny, he'll be analysing it as well with the upcoming games that we've got. And it'll be interesting to see how we're actually going to play against that type of system. But they might be different under Koeman anyway when he takes over because he, Koeman predominantly liked to play four at the back. So it might be interesting to see if they do change the system and go to four at the back. So I, I, I've just, I, I like... I like teams setting up differently. They, they don't. If you watch Brazil, Brazil give the ball away and they chase, harry the ball. Four or five players go and win it quickly, high up the pitch, like we see from Man City, like we see from Liverpool and maybe Real Madrid and various sides around Europe. They, they don't do that. They, they filter back into position quickly and then they go on the press off that initial pass. So I like watching what they do. I, I like seeing it and. I th- as I said, I think they just play a different style from from some of the other top teams. Uh, to give you your due, uh, the, uh, despite the fact that it was on penalties, Morocco were still full value. It wasn't a smash and grab job against Spain. Will they continue that against Portugal, yeah. or is this their are they as far as they go? I, I don't fancy them. I think it's as far as they go. I, I was at the the Portugal Switzerland game the other night, and I think they're on a different level from yeah. Spain. I think the, the good uh, wh- wh- why why I thought it was with the Spain game why why they'd be able to do it because they have a way of playing where they're able to go attacking, they're able to get bodies forward, which they did against Spain. Probably, you know, they did have chances. They, they had a lot less possession in the game, but I just felt the way Spain play the, and the lack of penetration that, that they have throughout that Spanish side. Great football, and don't get me wrong, it is. But I, I don't enjoy watching Spain. I didn't enjoy watching Spain at the Euros when they played the same sort of style. And I just fancied Morocco would have a little bit too much for them. And again, it's, it went to penalties, so it was... It could have gone either way, so you know the call becomes doesn't become great in the end. But I did fancy him to do something in the match, whereas Portugal different age and they oh. they have the penetration with Ramos. They have they have I mean Yao Felix. He, I I we where I was sat or when I went to the game, we were right in front of um, Switzerland warming up, and six or seven of the Switzerland players, Akanji, um, Mbolo, um, Shakiri, Xhaka. Um, Fabian Shaw, they were absolute tanks. Like they look huge compared to the Portuguese players. They were so, you know, if you're looking at them physically, one side to another, Switzerland should be outpowering them, outplaying them in every way because they're a decent side, Switzerland. But João Felix looked like a little boy. Bernardo Silva. Um, there were so many of the sides. You're thinking physically they won't be able to compete, but the way they move the ball, the the movement off the ball. I just think they've got way too much for um, sensational. For they look like World Cup winners to a to a. They, to d- they did, and 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 I mean, immediately by taking Ronaldo out the side edge, and they looked like a side that could go and win the World Cup. They, you never would have thought thought that in the first two or three games that they played. So, I I think they're serious contenders. I think if 
yeah, and, and, and it's easy to say if they play like that, but it's the style of play that they've got. There's so many different aspects to the game where they have the bit of needle in them if necessary. You know, they'll they'll tactically foul at times. They'll break the game up if necessary. But the flowing football that they play is going to be so hard to stop. And I just think this is a step too far for Morocco. I think Portugal will will win this. I think it could be two or three. Actually, I think they'll win it handily enough. Is um, France a step too far for England, Kev? Uh, I think this is a, this is the stereotypical fifty fifty game. Um, as much as I, I have fear that England is going to beat France. Uh, if you're asking me to honestly heart and head and things like this, I, I honestly do think that because of Mbappé, and it's only because of Mbappé that France will win the game. I can't see England being able to stop him for 90 minutes. And the moments that he's had in this in this tournament so far have been very special. And it has been a moment's game from him. Some of the games he's been electric for, for long spells and he's managed to score in, in the games that he's played. I can't see them being able to shut Mbappé down. If it, Even look to the, the Poland game, the last game. Matty Cash did quite well against him. And, and the truth is, if, if you're a fullback and you're playing against a superstar like that, you know, he had moments in Bappy where he was able to get away, but he actually did well. And I thought, yeah, good, good performance. And then he scored two unbelievable goals because you just can't stop him. And that'll be the same with Walker, I think, at times. I thought Walker, we tried to do a little bit of analysis for, for this game on the matchup and how it's going to go between Walker and, and Mbappé. We've tried to do a few matchups throughout the team, actually. But Walker and Mbappé, I think we all accept it's going to be a key one for how England are going to set up. And Walker had a couple of moments in um, in in the game. Who I can't really play. Who they play now? Um, Wales. No, who did they beat? Senegal they beat in the last round. Senegal, yeah, Senegal. Jesus, I'm cracking up here. Yeah, in, and he he had a few moments where he switched off, and he, 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 I think he gave the ball away once, and and just he, he almost like be just lost his head a little bit and didn't filter back into position. I think. That's the type of moment that I think France will hurt them. And again, we've all done it. Every, every one of us has done it. And maybe you're, you're overanalyzing things when it comes to that. But I don't know if Walker's going to be able to keep Mbappé uh, quiet for, for the 90 minutes or 120, however that game's going to go. I think it'll be that tight. I think there's going to be goals. I think we could look at easy one apiece, two apiece in this game. And and again, I think they've both got so much talent um, attack-wise that, that could hurt each other. But... I just think I, I'm going to go with France. I just think France will win it, and that's not maybe is my heart telling me that, but my head saying that France just just have too much with, with Mbappe and the team. Uh, Jude Bellingham has obviously got legitimately a lot of praise coming his way. John Giles was making an interesting point in the show last night. He was talking about his needing work and his positional sense. He says uh, that he gets into position. Um, he's, he doesn't enough get into a position to dictate the uh, dictate the game. That he shouldn't be waiting for the ball to come to him. That he should be putting himself in a spot to to uh, ensure the ball comes to him. Um, what's your mm. view on that? It's an interesting one. Johnny's Johnny is the best at when when he analyzes the midfielders and at seeing positional sense. Absolutely, um, I think he, I, he's, he's certainly a player to me at times that that goes forward too early. Um, from what from what I've from what what I've seen, even when I was watching him at Dortmund this season, sometimes he would he would break away too quickly. Say you're in transition and he's gone, and you can look at it from the other side of that to go, he's, he's, he's away quickly. If that pass comes, he's in quickly. The opposition can't, um, can't adjust to that accordingly. But I think with him, I think by doing that sometimes in this type of game, by vacating his position, by going forward and not necessarily being in position to receive the ball or maybe pass forward and run forward, I think that could be a problem again in this match. Um, so it's interesting to see. We, 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 we looked at it a couple of times again and, and saw him breaking away a little bit too soon but off it when when he gets it and he drives forward look at the the, the Sterling goal against the, Iran him breaking forward even the first goal against Senegal and how it was his run that created the get the created the goal he opened the team up just with that run forward so um I mean yeah I mean again John's way more of an expert on me to, to, to do that but I have seen it I have seen that maybe vacating that position might be a problem for England and it could put pressure on Rice it could put pressure on Henderson if, if, if it is those two to start the game uh, by him being out of position too early so I don't know it's there's a lot of things that you can even look at with France Rabiot does the same at times he, he breaks forward too quickly it might be too early at times but I think what's been overlooked from this game is Griezmann's influence on that French team I think Griezmann has been I'd have him in my team of the tournament up to now, Griezmann. Maybe not necessarily scoring all the goals, but the influence that he's having on that France team with his work rate, 
with his passing ability, his his dead ball um, ability. I think Griezmann's been great in that team. So even Dembele, I think Dembele's been outstanding as well. So I think France, like England, have so much to their attack that we maybe overlook them. I mean, are France better than England defensively? I think it's a I think it's a flip of the coin on Pickford and Lloris goalkeeper wise. I wouldn't necessarily say either, but Pickford has probably been better over the last year than Lloris. So I'd maybe go on, on Pickford on that one. Yeah. Centre half the, the Stones and, and Maguire against um, um, uh, Upper Camby and um, I, I've got, I keep getting that Can name wrong it, actually. And Varane. Varane. Uh, no, no, it'll be no, it'll be up up. Um, Upper can be from uh, from um, by Munich. It'll be him and Varane that will start the game. Kunde will Kunde up up Kano, That's it, and uh, and Kunde will probably start right back. It's it's a fifty fifty call defensively. Probably I'd say France slightly over England defensively, and everywhere else it's it's still fifty fifty. So it's it's such a tight game all over the pitch that it it, it will come down to how good they are in attack and both both sides' strength is in attack and. I think France are just better. I think than England slightly better. So that's where I'm. That's why the only reason why I'm going to go for France. One last one on your uh, specialist topic here, and we've got about a minute. So, um, Rice and Grealish, Martin O'Neill, he's on Talksport. He's saying that uh, he's re yeah. re uh, reignited the conversation, but uh, effectively saying that he it wouldn't have been right to cap them. We would have been coercing them to play for a country that they ultimately didn't want to play for. And uh, from your Twitter account, you agree. I do agree. I know. I, I I listen to some of you guys. I mean, it's probably done now. It's done and dusted long ago. Um, listening to Dan last night, I think he was on with you, Adrian. Where the, the the situation between Rice and Grealish is different because Grealish was never called up, or he was he was called up but never played uh, senior international. So <laughs> that's it. Um, you know, my thoughts on Rice. Rice should never have played for us in the first place, and he made himself available. If if he had no intention of, of following it through, he should never have made himself available to play international football um, with us so I wouldn't have called him up if and I agree with Martin he, yeah he sat there on the bench and he, he plays he, he doesn't really want to play for, for, for Ireland and, and yet he's playing that game against Moldova that that, that, that Dan was speaking about last night I, personally I wouldn't have had him in the squad and you, you know my feelings on it he should never have played for us um, and I'd rather not have a player like Declan Rice in my squad and I said it at the time I'd rather never qualify for a World Cup again and 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 not have Declan Rice in, in my team. I, I I felt as though it was underhand what he did at the time. Um, no matter how how old you are, that, that was my feeling on it because I knew who who I was when I was his age. That was my point on it. So it was he was hedging his bets at the time that if that England call wouldn't have come or if it wasn't on the horizon somewhere down the line, um, he would have carried on playing for us and he still would have probably have thought himself like what if like that, that would have been in the back of his mind I should have played for England and I don't want to play a plane f for us that, that has that sort of mentality and um, I don't know you, you know how I feel so it's yeah. pointless me going oh it's, it's all ground and that, exactly. that's how I feel on it exactly. really and I think that uh, you know one of those conversations that uh, we can all put to bed now and uh, turn the key in it and uh, never I, it'd be brought again. up again though we, we, we're going to have a situation like this in the future we will have a yeah. situation and it might not necessarily be England next time it might be you know Nigeria it might be uh, Poland or whatever you know it, it, we'll, we'll have this conversation but I don't know. One of you guys said the other day. I think it was. Well, I might have been you, Shane, or someone. I was listening to you yesterday, the day before. It's, it's only because it's England. Why we think so strongly about it? It's because it's England. If it was anywhere else, if point. it was Nigeria, if it was Poland, would we care as much? I don't think we would. Yeah. And that's the truth. No matter how good they become, it's because it's England. And I had the situation as a youngster when you know it. It, it could have been. I might never have played for England senior team. I, who knows? But I was called up for England, and I said no because it was never going to be. It was never in my thinking. I didn't want to play for England, first of all, for, for many different reasons, but I could never have played for them. And that was entirely how I thought at the time. So, it, And that was because it was England. If it was a different country that I was eligible for, I may have thought differently. But because it was England, I thought that there was no way I could play for, for them full stop. And that was it. So... That, you'd have got the call up, the Kev. Only... Phil Neville got a lot of caps. You definitely, you'd maybe, have been... <laughs> no, I, uh, maybe my too. ability, maybe my, maybe my ability suggested that I would have. I don't know. Again, who knows? Who, who is to know what it would be? I think there's a lot of England players that have had caps that are, that, that, are, that wouldn't be as good as me as a player, and you know I would have felt that. But it was, it was, it, I didn't care about that. I didn't want to mm. play for England. Yeah. So why on earth would I be thinking hard about that? 
it, when when all I wanted to do was play for Ireland, I wanted I, all I wanted was one cap for Ireland. That would have done me. That's the truth. So I think once you play, of course, you want to play more, and you feel as though that that's it. You can contribute in different ways. But why on earth would I have had that? You know, mindset of you know I'm upset because I've never had an England cap. It, it would it just wasn't it wasn't in me. So that was how I felt at 12 and 13. So. I didn't think any differently when I got to 17, 18, 19. It was, it was who I was and that was it. And 110 caps isn't bad, Kev, either. It's all right. Decent. Well, that, that's what it means everything to me. It means a lot more, Shane, when you know who you are as a person, you know what you stand for and, and everything that goes with that. So, you know, as I said, playing once for Ireland meant way more than, than getting, as I said, 100 England caps. Like It, it wouldn't have made any difference to me. Honestly, it, I, I, it would never have happened because I wouldn't have let it happen. How I felt at the time was just in my heart. And I, and I think everybody knows, no matter what you say, every, when you play, international football has always got to be special. It's always got to be something very different. So where, where were you? What, what were you doing the first time you watched an international game and you saw the team lining up for the anthem? How did you feel when you were 12 and 13? You know it. You can answer the question clearly in your own head. You, I've heard you talking about the telly being wheeled into your class at school. You remember these are memories mm. for you. And I remember where I was when I was watched Ray Houghton score against England, seeing the team play first off in Italian 90. I, I remember that. I, I don't remember anything about any other nation, really. I remember moments from other nations. But after seeing England play, uh, sorry, after seeing Ireland play England in, in uh, Italian 90, the first time playing in that World Cup game, seeing Kevin Sheedy score the World Cup goal, that memory will be ingrained in my head forever. So after seeing those those great memories and seeing those great goals that were scored by those those iconic players, I wanted to emulate them. And that was the only thing that was in my mind. And I was, well, I was 10 when Ray Houghton, or 11 when Ray Houghton scored against England and 12, 13 when Sheedy scored against England. That is all I wanted to do. So, you know, it, 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 it it's a it's a such a, a stupid question even when it's thrown at me that I'd never play for England or you know I, play, I picked Ireland because because I'd never get an England call up that, that's been thrown at me from, from England supporters I think you guys know it's true and I know who I was and I know who I am I could never have done it so regardless of whether I was never called up for Ireland and I tell everybody as well I, when I was called up for England Ireland was never even on the horizon it was never even mentioned it was never even I don't think anybody in Ireland knew that I was eligible to play for Ireland at that time. Um, I was called up for England and I said no because I could not I, I could never have done it and that was it. I knew it was a mistake asking you a question about that and I hope that you'd keep it to a minute. Kev, come on. Thanks a million. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry for keeping you <laughs> No, 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 no. That was worth it. Come on. Enjoy the games. All right. Good. Thanks a lot. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Kevin Caban on the line there from the World Cup. Uh, pretty interesting stuff as always. It's uh, eight forty eight. It is Friday morning. Very good morning to you, uh, wherever it is you're at. I hope the snow isn't too bad and that you're safe and well and uh, enjoying the show this morning. Do keep the comments coming into us. A reminder, by the way, that the Leopard Strong Christmas Festival will take place from December twenty sixth to the twenty ninth. It's a great day out for sporting fans, for socialites, for thrill seekers alike. And every day this week, we've had two hospitality places for the Leopard Strong Pavilion to give away. You're going to get a reserve table, you get lunch, you'll get a chat and some tips for some top tipsters as well and plenty more besides. To enter, just uh, comment with a Christmas tree emoji, which plenty of you have been doing this morning uh, on our main Twitter page, at Off The Ball you're automatically then in the hat and remember to ensure that your DMs are open because that's how we contact you. The Leopardstown Christmas Festival, December 26th to 29th tickets are from €35 Euro and they're available at leopardstown.com Right, let's keep it moving. Back to the rugby we go. Alan Quinlan, good morning. Morning, lads. How are you? Uh, good. Thanks for being uh, patient uh, and waiting on the line there. Um, let's get straight into it on the Highland Cup, Quinny, if we can. The format of this thing looks so weird. It's uh, almost uh, so weird as to be hard to understand. Uh, why haven't we gone back to the uh, pools of four teams? Uh, I don't know that. Um, I'm not on uh, one of the decision makers in the EPCR. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of people w- 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 are commenting on the format and saying it's confusing and uh you know you, we have 12 teams uh you've you've 24 teams 12 in each in two pools and and the top eight from each pool go into the knockout stage is round 16 game and and you're ranked according to you know points scored where you finish matches one all that kind of stuff as to where those those games are on uh in the round 16 um 
yeah, it's, I don't know. I think it's, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a massive lover of the European Cup. I have great memories from it. Um, it's a very, very special competition. You hear lots of players this week talking about it being a different, a different training week. There's a different buzz around um, each camp, if you like, uh, going in, into Europe. And it's really intriguing. You know, you're going playing against, uh, you're going out of your comfort zone here. You're going into a different, a different sort of um, challenge for, for for teams and players individually playing against, you know, more quality pack squads um, and and playing different teams around Europe. So it's a it's a great competition. Always has been, but yeah, just part of me would love love to see the the, the smaller pools go back to its original mm. format. It was originally reduced from twenty four to twenty back out to 24 you know because of COVID and they've stuck with this format um, it's still a great competition and I'm, I'm always very wary and careful of, of criticising because I love I love the European Cup but if I was one of the decision makers I would certainly look to go back to the pool stage um, the original pool stage where you had four teams in a pool and um, you had six rounds and I, I know the original format had six rounds and a quarterfinal, semi-final, final. That was nine, nine matches to to win it. Um, we're now at eight matches. They've got a free weekend for the first time. Um, the back, the, the round sixteens were 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 back to back games last year. So we're gone back to eight weekends basically, and there's a free weekend there. And I know player welfare and uh, the top fourteen and and Gallagher Premiership welcome that because. Um, getting an extra break or an extra week, but for me, the old the old system was, and it's risky territory because um, a lot of people speak about this online, and I think if if EPCR asked the fans what would they want, um, possibly the old format, but it is what it is. It's 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 up and running again this weekend, and it is exciting, and uh, at least we still have the back to back games. You know the. Um, yeah, the double headers. Yeah, in round two and three. Not everybody's a fan of the introduction to South African teams either. Antoine Dupont wasn't uh, too shy about coming out um, this week to say that uh, he's finding it hard to grasp. I think was the words that he used um, about them being involved. Fair point for you, or move on? No, I, look, I think since they came into um, the URC, and I think they've been great for it. The quality has improved um, of, of the competition the competitiveness of it and um, it's alerted everybody else to to um, you know to their quality and what they can do and you look what the Stormers did last year the Bulls um, so I think it's uh, what he's saying is he, he kind of said which was I don't know if he was having a dig at the competition or, or, or the South Africans coming in but he was saying it's not a European Cup now if there's South African teams in but um I have less, I, you know, I have less problem with that than than the format. As I said, if you ask me, would I go back? I'd love to go back to the older format. Um, the intrigue of that, where you, um, you know, you have your six six pool games and um, the, you know, the the quality of that and the 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 the, the bite of that week after week. But um, he has he has a point. But they're in the URC and they've qualified on merit now, and I think. You know, it's just strange. It's something. It's something new, and we have to be adaptable to change. Uh, look at it, see how it goes. But it's it's a great opportunity for South African teams to play play all these European teams and and play in a an enhanced higher grade competition. So I don't have a problem with that. But I can understand from a player's point of view that you know traditionally you'd be you know the flights would be short, the travel wouldn't be that bad. You'd be going to France, UK vice versa are back and now some teams are going to South Africa for, for round one so it's a little bit different alright Quinny uh, Adrian mentions Antoine Dupont of course one of the players who's had a, a red card reversed and is free to play Munster Keane Healy being another notable one as well a uh, bit of bewilderment I guess in the game when you're seeing all these reversals like do we know what constitutes foul play in rugby right, uh, right now well I always thought the Keane Healy one was um, was a hard call on him um, letter of the law, the contact was there, and my I I kind of you have to be very careful in these decisions, Shane, because um, you can go with your 
um, go letter to law every time. And I've been very proactive and, and um, don't have a lot of tolerance for, for high shots, particularly the impact, the forward impact that you have the last last kind of point of contact where the defending player is is moving forward in an aggressive manner. You're always in a risky situation when you're upright like that. But I think, and I understand why it's been overturned because he's more, he's accepted the tackle. And I see some people speaking online and talking about it, that um, it's wrong and, and how are we going to progress forward? I think the clarity is there that um, there was a change of height from both players. Um, I know he has to be the one, the onus is on him to get his technique right. But for me, and I, I, I always look at it, it's the last surge forward. Keen Healy doesn't drive forward. He more accepts the, the tackle. And that's where, where the mitigation is in it for me. So um, if, there was a, if it was a yellow card on last Saturday night, I would have said that was, a, that was probably the right call. Of course, you'll have so much debate ongoing and um, we have to protect the players for sure. But when you're accepting a tackle, and we saw Andrew Porter um, get away with one over the summer on New Zealand, in um, you know, on the t- with his tackle on Brody Retallick, where it was more of an accepting tackle, and the week before we saw Angus Tavo, you know, his collision with with Gary Ringrose, where he's moving forward at the last minute, and that's where you're getting the the mitigation here when the video angles were really analysed and studied, and it's it's. It's kind of for the referee, Christoph Ridley, you know, he's making a really quick decision uh, with his TMO. Um, I thought, and it, it didn't surprise me that it's overturned, basically. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, we'll stick with the Munster Toulouse game, uh, Quinny, on, on, since DuPont has become uh, um, talking about Sunday, 3.15, uh, this one in Thomond Park. Um, what's your sense of like speaking about Japan specifically and obviously the, always the conversation is how do you stop them um, they obviously have a coach now Munster who's been uh, involved maybe more than most in trying to stop him over the last couple of years and Mike Prendergast um, what's your, your sense of maybe that aspect of it and uh, the challenge for, for Munster here against one of the top teams in Europe how do you stop him is it yeah <laughs> um, it's very difficult I think it's it's a bit like um I suppose England playing France tomorrow night, how do you stop Mbappe? Um, and, and a lot of the English players this week have been asked that question. Um, it's difficult because he's such a wonderful player and not and it's not just in, in, in his attacking game. I think he he, he makes so many uh, brilliant tackles and puts so much pressure defensively with his line speed and um, he's a very physical player and he's a great tackler as well. So, not alone does he, you know, make unbelievable line breaks. He defends and he saves to lose at times. If somebody gets in behind him, he's always sweeping around or making, making tackles. Um, and look, they've they've unbelievable quality right across the board. I think they've so much depth in their squad, so much power, um, and he can play off the back of a, a usually a very very dominant physical pack or forward. So, um, but he's a natural talent. I think he just plays. He's a great reader of the game and he just plays with a freedom and he wants people to react to him. So I think if you're if you're playing with Anton Dubont, you're you're every time he gets the ball, I think as a support player, you're just thinking, This guy is gonna do something special, I gotta get on his shoulder. But he's reading in the game as well. If somebody else makes a line break, he's just there. His support lines are brilliant. And uh, so how do you stop him? I think you've got to try and if you focus too much on him and your own, um you just have to get your your whole team to be really alert every time he touches the ball, um, because if you shoot out of the line to try and smash him and think, "God, I'm going to get a big tackle in here," he'll step you or he'll he'll pop a little ball off or offload back inside or whatever. So, I think you just got to be very disciplined in your defence and very mindful that he runs that inside line when Toulouse move the ball out towards their wingers or outside centres. If anybody gets their hands free or through there. If there's any sort of a line break, he's running that inside line so much. He scores tries, a lot of tries for France and Toulouse like that. So um, you've got to be very careful. You can't just stop him. But I think um, collectively across the board, when he puts his hands in the ball, 
um, you've got to be really disciplined and stay connected because he can step you as well. I was fascinated when he listened to, to Brian O'Driscoll chatting to Adrian on the show last night where he was talking about Munster maybe needing a proper number 12 in that centre pairing and he kind of compared it to himself and Jonathan Davies I think in the Lions tour of, of 2013. Um, interested just to get your take on that. Yeah, well, uh, I think they've... Obviously, Chris Farrell is not there and um, Fekitoa, you know, hasn't kind of hit the heights that they would have wanted. Um so there, there, there is. Um, you, you feel, yeah. I think Rory Scannell has played well in the last couple of weeks. He looks a lot fitter. He looks a lot. Um, he looks to have some confidence back. Um, but you need more depth there. You need options. You need to be able to change that up during the game as well. And Munster don't have that luxury of that depth at the moment. So, you know, Malachi Fekitoa hasn't played in the last couple of weeks. He has been available, so he's not kind of. Um, fitting into the system and and that's a disappointment when you go and sign a player of his caliber and have him you know um played for for new zealand and been been a top a top international when he's played he doesn't seem to uh you know be impressing the coaches there and, and doing the job and i don't know the ins and outs of why he's not getting selected but um they're obviously playing with a system where they're trying to to keep the ball alive and keep more continuity and, and, and they feel that Rory Scannell is 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 helping that system and able to slot into that system. So whether it's more understanding from Malachi Fekitoa and um to buy into what they're trying to do do there. But it's probably, you know, for Drico to talk about the centre partnership, he's an expert in that, I think. And obviously <clears throat> you'd love to have um Without being disrespectful to Chris to Rory Scannell, I think he's he, he's shown the last couple of weeks that he is a quality player and he can step up. He, as I said, he looks a lot sharper. But you know, when you look at the other um, teams that potentially could win this competition, there's there's international players right across the board, top class international players. So there's a little bit of a depth issue there, as there is probably in the front row for Munster, and we saw that when they played Toulouse in May. The power. And the physicality and the type of players that Toulouse can bring off the bench, but um, he's he's doing a really good job at the moment, and I think that's uh, they've played much better in the last couple of weeks. And you think of Anton Frisch at outside centre, um, the more time you can get the, the ball in his hands at the moment, I think um, the better for Munster. Who wins it in a word, Quinny, if you can? Who wins it? Um, and what I've seen the last couple of weeks, I think Monster Monster can, can can get a result here against all the odds. Really, I think they can possibly win this one. Yeah, hard to back against them uh, at home. Racing Leinster Le have tomorrow. It's a game that's live and off the ball. They're obviously racing away from their home. What uh, I know you've been impressed with Racing's improvement up front. Enough for them to get the job done. Um, yeah, you can never say that against Leinster, can you? Because of of their ability and their quality, they're their favourites for this competition. I think you'd you'd fancy um, Leinster and probably Saracens, Toulouse, maybe Clermont, La Rochelle. There's about five of them again that kind of are sticking their heads above the water there. That 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 can be potential winners. Uh, maybe you know, who knows? We'll see. We might we might um, we might see a, a surprise or two along the way. Um, but um, I think Leinster, obviously, their 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 mentality and their quality can go to France and get a result. But I just think this one is, it could be, um, it could be tricky for them, you know, and it's one of those ones where it's just, it's maybe about um, just getting the result, um, any sort of a result here, because sometimes with Leinster, the expectation is because of, of um, you know, that the, their standing in this competition and their, their the way they've challenged in the last number of years and obviously won it, uh, and four occasions that you know they go and they just get these kind of results. I think they'll they'll be very mindful of the fact that they're going going to play against a very physical side, a big side who uh, Racing are second in the top fourteen, and they've been they have a lot of power and they focus a lot on their mall this year, and that was an area where you know I think they underperformed, and I think. Leinster's Mall obviously is a very very potent weapon for him as well but I think uh, physically um, 
we always know that Racing have quality outside and they have big, strong, abrasive players. But collectively, I just think they've improved a fair bit this season and they look like a side that have a bit of a hard edge to them up front. So it's going to be a physical game for, for Leinster, uh, one that they're very capable of winning for sure. But um, And look, I think Leo Cullen, Stuart Lancaster, they, they won't mind as long as they get they get some sort of any sort of a result as regards um, getting the win on board but um, it's on in Le Havre it's it's moved from their 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 own ground uh, the La Defence Arena in, in Paris so it's a little bit of a strange scenario there's a concert on there um, does that take away a little bit of that home advantage and that's that's um, you know f- for Racing playing at home it's actually moving a little bit now so um, I still think Leinster win the game, but I just think it's going to be a, a pretty physical challenge for them and um, it might not be as easy as some think. Yeah, they go uh, concerts first, actually, at the stadium, which is an unusual take on things. Uh, we sail Ulster on Sunday as well and Connacht Falcons in the Challenge Cup too. One before we leave you, just in the RFU announcement during the week, the completion, obviously, of the review, the publication of that, the announcement of the €1 million Euro for uh, facilities and pathways, I think is uh, how they've worded it. Uh, talking, as Shane said to Brian yesterday, he was talking about, uh, like, a million euro is good and it's never going to be enough, but generally seen as a, po- a, a forward step, a positive step. Yeah, well, it's the whole situation is much better than what it was. Okay, there's it's the same with the contracted players. The the actual uh, money that they're getting should it be more? There's, there's there's always questions, and but I think what the RFU have done here and what their what they um, um, what the report tells us is that there there needs to be more investment, and that investment is going to happen. They're going to set up regional centres of excellence. Um, there's a, going to be a big focus on improving the the All Ireland League, and I think that's where you've got to get the grassroots and the fundamentals of the game. And it's very similar in the men's game. And I've said this many times. You know, if you get your club game and get more players playing, more competition, increase the numbers, increase the skill sets um, of young girls playing the game, and I think. The one thing that jumps out for me is is, is the, the centre of excellence that they're going to create in each province. That you know, there's a lot of good work going on there with with coaching and development and all that kind of stuff. But the fact that they're really honing in on this now and and trying to get more young girls who uh, increase their skill levels at a young age, but also try and strengthen the clubs. You know, it's very difficult when you have such dominance with the Dublin clubs in the All-Ireland League, and that's very, very obvious. Um, so around the country, you increase the, the competition, you get a more meaningful All-Ireland League that's more balanced. Um, that will take time because it's difficult to just um, put money at that and think it's going to work straight away. It's going to take a little bit of time. But I think they're the obvious improvements that are needed and the obvious changes that's that's need to be focused on is to try and improve the All-Ireland League and then in a simple terms you get more girls playing you get more competitive games and you get it more balanced and that improves the you know the the, the opportunities for girls to play really really competitively and there's not one-sided fixtures that we see a lot of at the moment so um, I think it's very very welcomed and I think um, you know the RFU are putting putting into action now um, uh, recommendations that have come out of the report. So from where we were with all the, the controversy before, I think these are positive steps and positive things that are happening for the women's game. Yeah, all right, that is the name of the game. Uh, thanks, William. Enjoy the games. Yeah. Thanks, lads. Alan Quinlan is always with us on a Friday. A reminder, by the way, as well, if you're looking for more uh, rugby chat, the only place to listen back to Monday Night Rugby, Wednesday Night Rugby, and to Brian as well in full is on the OTB uh, Rugby podcast feed. So wherever it is that you uh, pick up your podcast, you can head along there and subscribe. It's all free and it's on the OTB app. So uh, go along there. It's the best place to get it. Right, it is almost 10 past nine. It's Friday morning. It's myself and Shane with you until uh, 10 this morning. And good morning to you, wherever it is you're at. I hope you're out and about safe. 
safely. Um, there's a bit of frost and snow on the ground about the country, so um, do keep it safe this morning. Uh, we're brought to you live each morning, of course, by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. You can tune in to the lunchtime wrap today, uh, which brings you all the very latest in sports news and uh, with a particular focus on the World Cup at the minute. And that is all with thanks to Deliveroo. You can check out the uh, Deliveroo app for some great match day meal deals across the World Cup. Foo- uh, Deliveroo food, we get it. Here is what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio across the day. Emmanuel Petit is a subject of uh, OTB Gold from one. Offaly as the Mount Rushmore at three. Tony Sheridan will be the League of Ireland legend for Team 33 at four. And then uh, from one Kilba- Kilban to another, no relation, I believe. Um, same neck of the woods, though. Johnny Kilban, the uh, great Ackle boxer. OTB Gold from six o'clock today. You can follow uh, OTB across all of our social channels as well. Subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in uh, and latest in sports content. After the break, we're going to be uh, joined on the line by Morris Deegan, who has just retired as a GA ref. He's going to reflect um, on his career with the whistle. Uh, before all of that, John Giles on the show last night on the topic of Brazil's goal celebrations. Here's what he had to say. Um, I thought they were showing off a little bit too much the other night. Um, Did you? Yeah, because we've been talking about that a bit on the show, yeah. Sorry? We've been talking a bit about the celebrations, yeah. Yeah, well, the celebrations one thing, but it's just even the way they play it at times, you know. It was as if they were going out to show off uh, how good they were, rather than getting on with the game and, and getting it done. Well, they did get it done in the end. They won well in the end. They were too good, far too good for South Korea, uh, who, who I think the occasion was too much for them. Um, but as as we as we saw from Brazil, a lot of good players, Adrian. Mm. You know, but I think they were overdoing the show the showboat a little bit too much. You mean you don't mean the dancing so much as actually during the game? Uh, during the game, yeah, I don't mind the dancing too much. That's when the goal is scored. It can be overdone, but I thought during the game they were they were showing off a little bit too much instead of getting on with the get getting on with the job, you know. Yeah. OTB AM. OTB Sports Rugby. I went over to Scotland about six weeks ago. We went on a whiskey distillery tour, and it was just it was sad and fantastic. And he was a, like a beautiful man, wonderful man. I think the legacy he will leave is not just that he were a rugby player, I think it's the fight he shows. Subscribe to the rugby stream on the OTB Sports app now. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prices include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 12 minutes past 9, OTB AM. Shane and myself with you until 10. A very good morning to you and a very good morning to Morris Deegan. How are you keeping? Morning, Adrian. Nah, not too bad in yourself. We were hoping to have you in the studio this morning, but I think the weather has scuppered us. <laughs> yeah, I, I was halfway up the N7 this morning, and uh, it was like a it was like a car park. So I decided to turn around and come back. It was a safer option, so it was. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's brutal out there. A reminder to everybody to keep nice and safe. Um, how's the body? Body is sore now, Adrian. I'm not going to tell you a lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I got a fair whack now on on Sunday. Um, my arm is sore, my wrist is sore, and the knee is not great, and the hip. I never felt that in like it was like being in a car crash. So it was, to be honest. Yeah, it looked um, like I, it took the wind out of you in that moment. You were down. I was watching. And I thought, Jesus, are you going to get up here? You were. Uh, it was a proper wallop. <laughs> it was, to be honest with you, Adrian. The stubbornness in me. Uh, I said to myself when I got up and I looked up at the clock and it was about 12 minutes to go and I said, look, I have only another 12 more minutes of my inter-county career to, to referee here. So I said, I'll, I lost it out to stay going. <laughs> what, 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 what's the contingency there? The, your, one of your assistants comes in? and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fergal Kelly was the standby ref. He would have come in for me. Like, you know what I mean? So there was a contingency plan in place anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. Uh, it's one of the hazards of the job. I suspect, Morris, that when you're weighing these things up, that's well, not a not not your priority. I would have thought in any given week. That <laughs> no, I know. I hadn't planned to know. To be honest with you, know, to be getting belt, getting hit by two sixteen stone fellas, uh, 
half my age and nearly drove me about 10 yards into the air. <laughs> so, it doesn't, I'm, uh, I'm surprised in some regards because like the, by nature the gig, you're, you're there and thereabouts with the action all the time that it almost doesn't happen more often. Yeah, well, you see, to be honest with you, the lads would always be slagging me that I, I, I don't keep up with play. My problem was on Sunday, I was too close to the play. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, what do you call it? Look, the, the way the game has gone, it's as everybody knows, the speed of it has just it has taken off. And to be a referee nowadays, I suppose you have to be able to be as fit as the players like, you know. Mm. Does it does it seem strange or feel strange, Morris, to be referred to now as former inter-county referee? It does, Shane, to be honest with you. Yeah, I was down in Kerry yesterday, you know, just doing a bit of a run. I met the Gooch down there, you know, and we were just chatting about it. And uh, we, what do you call it, uh, like you're walking through the streets and, of course, everyone is football mad down there and everyone is stopping you and saying, what are you going to do now and what's the what's the plan and uh, for the future? But uh, uh, to be honest with you, I, I nearly, I'm nearly happy that uh, I'm finished up. I, I've had a great uh, 22, 23 years at, at refereeing uh, inter county, to be honest with you. So, and like uh, the body can only take so much. And I, as from what happened on Sunday, I can tell you one thing Monday morning wasn't great waking it up. <laughs> did, you, did you ever think when you first picked up a whistle that you'd, you'd have that career that you end, ended up having three All Ireland finals, 08, 2012, and the replay in 2016? It's not honest. bad. No, well, to be honest with you, Shane, I only I only went into it uh, like I, I think I've said it loads of times. Like I, I'd say about twenty three years ago, twenty four years ago, I was in my home club in Stradbally, and uh, I there was a, a practice match going on, and I was up there with the, my fiance at the time, my, my now wife Ashling, and uh, I. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the secretary came over to me and said, "Look, Morris, would you have to referee the match?" I had a, a, a jeans on me and a denim jacket, and sure. I said, "Look, I'll do it for you." And I done it, and uh, away it went. I didn't foresee that I would end up doing three All Irelands, as you said, Shane. To be honest with you, and uh, I, and I've been one of the lucky ones in a sense that uh, I, I've had a great career with refereeing and. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it between what friends I've met and uh, what people I've met and places I've travelled all over the world through it. Like you've just turned fifty, I think. So is that you? You have to bow out at this stage, Morris. Is that the Adrian? I haven't turned fifty yet. No, <laughs> I don't want to. Don't be too, hard, don't be too hard on me. I have another. I have another two weeks to go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say two years there for a second. I was no, gonna, no. How, offend, how actually offended uh, are you? Um, <laughs> so it's it, it the, because of that you have to bow. Out. Is that the the regulation? Yeah, at the that's minute, that's yeah? the regulation. You have to bow at fifty. Uh, you, you basically have to hang the boots up, and basically if your your inter county refereeing career is finished. Um, and and like look in some cases. I'm probably I probably fit enough to go for another two or three years yeah. if needs be, but I suppose you have to have some sort of a a benchmark as to when a referee has to finish. Do you know? So yeah. it does feel look, like kind of if if you were up like fifty now is not. Uh, and you know I'm not a huge amount behind you uh, 50 now is not what it used to be in terms of uh, you know fitness and, and general approach and stuff like it does feel as if particularly in a sport where like we're crying out for quality referees and for referees to stay in the game and that well yeah, yeah I, 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 th I think myself may be like you know how to look for myself personally I'm happy to go bow out at 50 but uh, I, I'd say as you said like uh Maybe it probably needs to be looked at, uh, especially with, uh, I suppose, with whether we we don't probably have the same number of referees there as before as we used to ha have, like, you know, so, like, it's getting harder and harder to recruit more referees, but I, I think the biggest problem is, is you might recruit the referees, but the biggest problem, in my eyes, is probably retention of referees, trying to keep them uh, refereeing, you know, that's 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 my my opinion anyway. Like. What's the biggest barrier to that? Sure, obviously you know yourself. Uh, the, the white elephant in the room mm -hmm. is 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 obviously uh, the abuse of referees. Like, do you know that's that's probably the big one, and that's what everyone is talking about at the minute. We've had um, myself and Shane have been chatting to David Goff, Mark McNally in recent months. It was particularly on the back of the Roscommon incidents uh, not that long ago. Yes. Um, about their own experience of it. Um, in all your years as a ref, what, what's your 
level of exposure to that, be it verbal or physical or otherwise? Well, to be honest, I've been one of the lucky ones. I've never been physically abused uh, as a referee, but as regards verbally abused, uh, yes, have. Club is probably the worst uh, when it comes to verbal abuse because it's at a more local level. Um, but I, I think at intercounty level, the big one is obviously social media. Like so, like it, it's it's it, it can drive uh, referees out of the game because a, a lot of, of people are are into Facebook and Instagram and all these different things. Now, I'm not on any of these forums. Um, and I think it's a good thing. Do you know what I mean? Because uh, I don't see what's going on. The only knock-on effect for me probably is my family sees it. I have two kids and they probably see it uh, quicker than, than anyone else will. Like, you know, so like there is a human side to it uh, for the referee if the if the, the social media bandwagon gets 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 rolling like against the referee and I've said it in the past a referee will make 100 150 decisions in a game there'll be two or three big decisions in that game and if he gets two or three of them right he's a great fella if he gets one of them wrong well then he's vilified for it uh, whatever about the the social media aspect and the on pitch abuse, Morris. Like you, you talked there about you know being down in Kerry and people come up to you on the street asking what you're up to next. Like over the last twenty two, twenty three years, have you had incidents where on the street people are coming up and saying, "Jesus, you you screwed us there at the weekend"? Or no, uh, no. To be fair, Shane, no, I, I've never ever had that. Like you know what I mean? In, in army times, uh, any time that I, I've been out and look at. Uh, you're, you're if you're going on holidays or you're walking down the street or whatever it is, uh, the general perception out there with 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 people is like keep it going. You're doing a good job and and uh, and like people generally want to just talk to you about the match and how you got on and you know generally them type of people aren't aren't the ones that will confront you. Do you know what I mean, Shane? Mm. Uh, I I generally found it now myself that. Uh, I was getting. It was a very positive approach. Uh, um, that was that was from my side of things. Like we, we could be walking down, myself and my wife could be walking down the street, and she got. She's getting so used. She got so used to it now that uh, someone could stop me. And, and like I don't want to be ignorant or like that and say, look, I don't want to talk to. You. I'd always talk to people and make sure I make time for them. And and Ashley could be gone. 20 hours down the road and I'd have to run after her to try catch up because she's gone so used to it at this stage, do you know? I almost feel like, you know, GA could learn a lot from rugby in terms of the decorum and the, the respect given to, to referees. Like, do you feel like, and it's something we spoke to, we spoke to the lads, uh, David Goff and Martin McNally about, but should referees be mic'd up in, in whether it's inter-county and club football? Like, would that, would that improve the level of abuse? Well, I've been a big advocate for this about uh, being mic'd up. Um, I think, to be honest with you, if 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 we're mic'd up and everyone can hear, we'll say what the, the referee is given a decision for. Well, then everyone knows what the decision is for, and there's no ambiguity. Like, and I I think going to go to 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 be able to we'll say push push the the future of refereeing on that a little bit further. I think that's a big 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 ask, and I think that's the way to go definitely going forward. One of the reasons, but the, I... but, the, but the problem is though, we have we, at the, at, the, at the end of it all, we have to realise that it's not only inter county because you'll probably only do that inter county. There is the club scene there as well, which is massive as well. Mm. I think um, like one of the reasons that was brought up at the time around the inter county bit, anyway, Morris, about the uh, miking up was that like obviously, unlike the professional game, the players are going back to day jobs afterwards and they might have been caught saying something on on Mike yeah. that maybe they shouldn't have been. Is that enough of a barrier to? Um, to not do it, do you think, or, yeah? Well, uh, look, uh, I, I suppose after, if you do it a few times, whatever, like the player will get used to it. Like you know, the player will learn just as quickly as the referee, mm -hmm. as the referee has to learn by it. Do you know? So I think education is a big thing. Uh, like players, no more than anyone will know the rules as well as the referees, especially at intercounty level because of the amount of education that they are are treated to, especially by like it's, it's the way players are now at inter county level like they will know most of the rules uh, uh, going forward like you know so i don't see that as being an issue
Jeez, it'd be great for clarity because it would. Oh, for, brilliant! Wouldn't yeah. it? Like you know, I agree. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, you know, like yeah. Yeah, American football is an example where you're at it and like you're looking at the game and you're not sure what's that decision been given for. The referee will literally be on mic to the stadium to say, "Here's why that happened." I mean, and if yeah. you look at it in an Irish context, David again was chatting about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the last time we had him on about like the lack of understanding of the rules from pundits. So like that evening, you've refereed in an Ireland final, that evening it gets picked over in fine detail by the Sunday game or ourselves or whoever it might be. And not yeah. everybody's on top of the rules. But equally, like we don't have the access to the likes of yourself to say, well, why why did that call happen? Or what was your understanding of what happened there? Um, and that can, pundits tend to fill that void with mm -hmm. um, with opinion that, that might not at times be uh, be accurate. I think, to be honest with you, Adrian, I think that's probably a little bit of a shortfall on the likes of RTE or any pundits like that, is that they probably don't have a referee uh, sitting sitting there so that they can ask them questions like there and then. And when I say a referee, uh, I mean someone that has refereed the game or something like that. And, and I put my name forward now. Well, listen, like yeah. Somebody <laughs> recently <laughs> retired Intercounty referee. And I put my name forward there now or anything. But I just think, as you said, it would give way more clarity, like, do you know what I mean, to to decisions that referees have have given tr uh, during a game. And uh, as I go back to it again, like... The referee is only human at the end of the day, and it, and and really and truly, like it'll be two or three decisions that the referee will be judged on. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And there's no point saying any different because that exactly is what he's going to be judged on. It's the same as a player. If a player gets the ball and he he's three chances at goal and he scores one, they're all going to talk. Well, what about the two he missed? <laughs> do you know that's yeah. it's just the nature that uh, that we're it's just the society that we're in. Like do you know. You mentioned Morris there, the players, you know, mostly knowing the rules at the minute, I guess. Um, yeah. And look, to an extent, the, the rules have, have changed that much the last couple of years. It's it's tough to keep up sometimes, but is, in some ways, this a good time for you to step away? Because you, I look at things like the advanced mark, for example, and uh, you, you almost wonder, yeah. well, how do referees, how, do, how, how can you possibly judge it sometimes? Well, like, the advanced mark is very hard. Like, there must be, there's three or four different, like, uh, scenarios that the referee has to think of. So, Obviously, it's a player outside the 45 and he kicks the ball in. Two, is he 20 metres away? Three, did he get, have a clean catch? Four, did he put the arm up? Do you know? And then when he gets it, then he's 15 seconds to kick it. So, uh, on the advanced market, yeah, that's probably a, uh, the hardest one, we'll say, to... How would you put it? it it's probably the hardest, uh, we'll say, a rule to referee uh, and to get it right all the time. Uh, the mark in the middle of the field is easy enough. Do you know? But... I like. They're improving, they're bringing in new rules, they're probably uh, trying to improve the game. Do you know what I mean? To be mm -hmm. fair, like, do you know? So, uh, as you said, like, I'm, I'm still going to be a refereeing at club level in Leash, like, do you know what I mean? But at Intercounty, I'm finished, like, do you know? So, mm -hmm. like, I, I still enjoy refereeing it. Uh, probably the biggest thing I will miss will probably be the buzz of going to the matches and obviously uh the buzz in the in the car when the five when the five are, are driving up to a match and the, and the bit of crack that we'd have coming home and and uh and stuff like that would you've always brought the same team with you Morris? i'd have a pick of about six or seven lads that would always come with me all the time like yeah. do you know what i mean um they would come with me all the time and i'd say down through the years i've probably had about 23 or four lads do you know what i mean whereas some lads have just uh, finished up and stuff like that so uh, like I've met great friends uh, from it for life and like uh, like I'll uh, I, I'll never forget that like Would you pick them for the All-Ireland Final as well or does that come from Crow Park? Yeah no no I'd pick them I'd pick them I remember one year I was doing the 2008 All-Ireland Final and I had five lads that I generally would have picked all the time that would have come at me all the time and I had to ring one of them fight to tell him that he wasn't going to be involved in the All Ireland. No, that was hard. Now, very hard. You know, yeah. I said, yeah. No, that was, that's like being a manager of a team yeah. and saying that uh, whatever isn't playing, you're not you're not picked for the for the final. It's funny those those three All Irelands that you did referee, Morris, all stand out as quality finals. Like Tyrone beating Kerry in 08, you'd, yeah. Uh, Donegal beating Mayo in 2012, and then the 2016 yeah. replay. Yeah. Uh, like, do do any moments in particular stand out as as career highlights for you? Oh, I tell you, uh, after the Mayo Donegal um, All Ireland final, uh, Donegal had won the, the, the All Ireland final. I think the first time in I don't know 40, years. 50 years, yeah. whatever it was. 
or 92, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they brought out a siege for us and we sat down in the middle of the pitch after the match and the crowd just started singing the hills of Donegal. It was just electric, you know, and there had been no hassle in the game. Every player and all the manager were coming up and shaking your hand after the game and, and you knew you had done a good job so you could actually sit down and relax because the the stress and the tension lead and pressure leading into the game because it was a big game in 2012 because it was a novel final and I, I even remember trying to get to the pitch uh, that the the crowds outside Crow Park even trying to get in was was ridiculous like you know um it was just it was it was just a brilliant feeling i'll never forget and like all my family were there at uh, at the match as well and and just t- little moments like that you know and uh and especially the all ireland final on the saturday with dublin and and mayo under under the lights like the the atmosphere on the saturday night uh, especially on the saturday night game under the lights was just electric because them dublin mayo games uh, back then were probably the highest calibre of games you could ever come across, uh, I'd say, in the last 20 years. Mm, so special. Any player that stands out, Morris, has been particularly, uh, how would I, I actually, it? I put that out, I said to myself, I said, I'll dry up a list here now, because I knew myself as a player. <laughs> when we asked this <laughs> question, what, what, what players do I think? Go like, on. Colin, Coop, Colin Cooper stands out. As, a, as uh, a, 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 one of the better ones. Oh yeah! Oh god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. as in, would never the... give you any back chat or. Well, no, I never said that. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about footballing talent here, I suppose. Yeah, I'm talking talent. about footballing talent. Okay. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask about the the ones that were particularly tricky to uh, to referee. <laughs> save that, save that <laughs> it sounds like he's in that category straight off the bat. <laughs> well, I was talking to Colm yesterday. Now it's just a funny story because uh, we were just chatting, and uh, Colm comes up to me and he says, "I never gave you much hassle." He says, "Did I down through the years?" Well, I says, "I remember one time I said." In the All Ireland Club final, I says when you were playing Schlock Neil, and uh, I remember you were running up to me uh, after about twenty minutes or twenty five minutes. You were coming up to give out to me over a over a free that I was after giving to Schlock Neil, and I turned around to you and I says, uh, "I says, Colin, um, where's your gum shield?" <laughs> so he had to turn around and run straight back to the sideline to get a gum shield off someone else. Tail between his legs straight away. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was him started sort of was before I could even before I even done anything. Um, cute carry lads. I like it. Gum shield yeah, socks exactly. probably. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't even in the sock. <laughs> <laughs> but like some players like the likes of Brian Doerr was he was just an exceptional player, a great leader on the team. Uh, like Sean Kavna uh, come to mind like straight away. Like Lee Keegan, another one. He was a gent, a gent. Really? On, uh, off the field, a very, very nice fella. On the field, uh, gave it 110% now, to be fair to him. Do you know what I mean? Michael Murphy, uh, very good player. Hard to handle at times, but very, very good player. Like, what do you know be? What yeah, I mean? what, what's the nub of that? Like, just sort of always looking for that. The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think I told him a couple of times if you wanted to whistle, I give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Another one that I'm sure sort of. Uh, what, what's the nature of that? So, is are they like, like when p- players are onto you like that? Is that because like uh, you know the 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 yeah uh, like the, yeah like they're questioning your every decision like you know yeah. what I mean? Which is fair enough. Like and mentally, you have to be very strong for that. Like you know so. Like it's probably part and parcel of the game. It's the same in soccer, rugby, anything, any sport. Like if the referee is seems weak mentally, well, obviously, like the players are going to really hone in on that, and they're going to do, do you know, do you know, because if, for argument's sake, the referee gives a decision, and there's three or four of them try to intimidate him to try turn it around but the referee stand well maybe the next time he might not give the free mm, as quickly mm, do you know what I mean mm. it's only human nature I keep going back to it the referee is just as, is, is as human as the players are mm. Manager, managers are supporters are um, I suspect if you're open to a call down the track when there's been um, an incident we'll certainly have you on again we really enjoyed your uh, company over the last 25 minutes or thereabouts thanks a million <laughs> and, and congrats on a brilliant career mm. Adrian Shane thanks a million totally Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks a million, Morris Deegan, uh, now former uh, GA intercounter referee. Really interesting pick through Class. the life and times, essentially. Yeah, unbelievable. And look at those three finals and 
you forget that that the, the relief you must get as Morris said after the 2012 final where you haven't been involved in a yeah. controversial or major decision and you can probably sit down with the family and watch the Sunday game watch yeah. the match back that's what I did there yeah because yeah, if, you, if, you, if you had a howler and, and, and a clear mistake I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't be let forget it uh, forget about it too easily. So I think uh, the mic thing is a great idea. I've I never actually when he opened his mouth, I realised I'd never heard him. I didn't couldn't tell you what he what he sounded voice. like. Yeah, you forget. Yeah. There's only a certain select one or two referees, maybe who you know, like yeah. David Goff we've had on a couple of times. But you, yeah, you don't know what we they should, sound like. Uh, we should put that right. That's a uh, like as a just a general refereeing thing. I do. Yeah. Think. Well, at least uh, Morris has his own leash. Actually, Dermot Derm- Derm- Gallagher has a couple of hybrid actions. Well, you can bring him. Take your pick. Back. Yeah, exactly. Take Right, you're off to the Christmas weekend plans, Shane. Oh, you're asking me again? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, was to, I had to get on to Owen about this afterwards last week and apologise to him. That, yeah, fair. Uh, you know. I was at a great thing last night, actually, uh, Shanakiha, it was called. Uh, right, what was that? Storytelling in uh, Fumbly Lane. So it was right. kind of just uh, 13 different people stood up and it was almost like spoken word, right. telling different stories and a couple of glasses of wine and a little bit of poetry as well. So felt very cultured leaving yeah. last night. The week, you weren't actually one of the Shanna Keys I wasn't then, no I was there in, uh, was there uh, as, a, as a member of the public yeah. to, to watch really really good highly recommend people to, to look right. it up Shanna Key, yeah, it's called um, and then yeah Christmas party tonight will be a little less cultured maybe mm. I'll control myself I have a big game from Ireland Town FC tomorrow oh have you yeah we've, uh, we've a league game against Killy Law at 4 o'clock in, right. uh, in Gord Keegan up in Monaghan and we have a team team Christmas party b- slash bonding session afterwards so right. <laughs> big couple of days big couple of nights Adrian Very good. thanks good for asking though enjoy listening um, that's, that's what I'm here for I think we can make that a regular thing yeah. uh, um, very good uh, OTBM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day it is uh, 9.35 on this Friday morning and before we go we're delighted to announce uh, drum roll that Gary Redmond has been selected as the final winner of our Leopard Sound Christmas Festival giveaway so congrats Gary enjoy that a reminder that the Leopard Sound Christmas Festival will take place from December 26th to 29th uh, really easy to get out there as well if you're um, around Dublin on the Lewis get on out and uh, enjoy your racing over the Christmas OTBM back Monday morning it'll be Jerry Shane and uh, the incredible it says here Gillette Performance Labs uh, performance rankings uh, we'll be live in Qatar with uh, the Irish Times journalist Gavin Comiskey we'll have all the reactions well to the opening weekend the Champions Cup and of course the uh, quarterfinals of the World Cup plenty as well besides right now we're going to see you up for the week with uh, Dan McDonnell who I was chatting to last night from uh, the World Cup he joined me on the football show and uh, here's that chat have a festive weekend chat to you next week Dan McDonnell from Qatar come on in Dan Hi Adrian how are things how are you getting on good Good. Um, everything is fine I here, mean, Adrian. It, yes, I'm really enjoying yeah. the experience, and I must not say yeah, too much. Everything is, everything is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean, it's it's um, what are we a couple of weeks in? Um, for the past the halfway point. Yeah, I can enjoy enjoying the football. Obviously, um, you know, there's other aspects of the competition has been well documented and, and been writing about them. Um, obviously, not not so great, um, but it's 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 sort of part of the uh, yeah. It's the this is the story of this World Cup, you know, like the the what I've said it before coming over here, like uh, the the history of the World Cup is always wrapped around the venue, and obviously, you know, particularly pronounced in this case. Yeah, um, we might talk about some of those stuff maybe uh, even to kick off with because obviously we're on the eve of the uh, World Cup quarterfinals now and uh, the reporting from Qatar today about a man named Alex uh, who's in his early 40s, he's from the Philippines. We've been using that vague old catch-all phrase um, about migrant workers up to this point and uh, now that there are actually some details about somebody who's passed away this week we might use them but um, Alex fell to his death while carrying out repairs it's reported on a resort which has been used previously by the Saudi Arabia team still be decked in all the um, FIFA uh, livery um, and uh, FIFA have issued a statement to say that they're uh, saddened by it and there's been other statements that have followed as well uh, but it's brought back up um, the agenda, Dan, a little bit of the conversation around the outrageousness of some of that stuff that's happened with migrant workers over the last decade. Have you felt that conversation on the ground there, or how how's that been? Yeah, and I mean, it's I suppose it's it's, it's striking as well, like the the case you mentioned. You had like the, you have a, you have a name, um, like you have you know you just have Alex. You know, you don't necessarily have a huge amount of detail, um, and obviously, like there's a real fear. Um, for staff on the ground or, or people working here to to sort of speak and, and tell their stories, you know, there in many cases there are sort of a lot of sort of faceless characters, um, because they're sort of I don't know f- fearful about uh, the consequences of maybe speaking out about uh, 
their situations here, their working situations here. I mean, all you can go off is your your own sort of uh, your first hand uh, impressions of it, um, and like it's it's certainly. Uh, you know, I, I've had sort of conversations, you have conversations with people, you know, in taxis or shops or, or you know, various members of staff. And, and again, like you can't generalize, you can't say every, you know, everyone is living the same experience. You know, some people are, are, are you, you chat to them and they're, they're reasonably happy with their life here, but obviously very aware of um, the idiosyncrasies of the place and, and the, the sort of the more worrying aspects of the place, the, the fact that, you know, the... They don't have any real sort of, uh, you know, union protection or anything like that. You know, they're obviously very aware of of uh, the implications if they complain. Like you, you chat to someone who say, who could tell you a story about. I think that we're going to just have to. Uh Knock Dan off the line there and uh, try and re-establish contact with him. Uh, they're just a bit of a dip off. In Wi-Fi, you're back, Dan. Sorry, Adrian, I don't know what happened there. Just, um, um, yeah, you were just talking about uh, chatting to some of the local people, some of whom, um, or, or the, yeah, the stories around the migrant workers at least seem happy with their lot. But I mean, look, at it, it's hard. It is hard because you're not there with a direct brief, obviously, to get stuck into that area. In terms of like the response, Dan, right? Like it, um, from the stuff that I've read, it seemed like, the, you know, a lack of safety equipment provided, either provided to or used by uh, Alex, who was dispatched to fix lights in a car park, we're told, um, and is one of the near uh, six and a half thousand, of course, depending on uh, where your sources lie, um, people that looks at the minute who uh, won't be counted as a death uh, relating to the World Cup, as it wasn't an official FIFA site. Um, and, and the response from officialdom just, it's... Um, like it's head scratching in that in the in the almost lack of awareness from them about managing the message almost even at this stage. Yeah, I mean, and like this is the thing about uh, Qatar, and the, you're right. Like there's sort of a, a dispute around like the, the the number of deaths, and 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 I think at one point they were trying to claim there was about maybe three people mm. you know had died working on the stadium. Now they've they've revised that upwards, um, and I think like you can dispute the specifics of, of, you know, specific numbers or figures and they have done that. But what is definitely can't be disputed is like the high number of unexplained deaths that there are and there have been in Qatar over the last uh, decade. You know, that uh, in most countries, you know, you have, you have to register a cause for death and there's a very, very small number of uh, unexplained uh, deaths. Whereas in Qatar, the figure is incredibly high. The percentage is incredibly high. Um this one has been reported it's very i mean i i know that sort of you know accidents on sites do happen you know but it's obviously just the fact that it, it it's tied in with this sort of uh this large figure over a period of time and yeah i mean the response what the, what was the quote uh you know that death is 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 natural you know in in, in life you know and in, in whether it's work or in your sleep or sort of words to that effect you know um it doesn't. It doesn't come across particularly. It doesn't well, quite capture it. Yeah, and the, the, no. there was the the uh, you know when the the CEO was on Piers Morgan, which I'm sure was a show like me, Dan, that you were uh, you're uh, a regular viewer of. It was uh, you know the the old cliche about one life being too many, and then you just had uh, like the FIFA general secretary uh, Fatma Samora out today or in the last 24 hours at least saying that it wasn't appropriate that she was asked about this even from a reporter uh, Neil Barker from SNTV. Uh, she was attending a FIFA conference. Almost how dare he sort of bring this up and then you had Nasser al uh who was in the same vein uh, Qatar 2022 CEO you know just incredulous that they're getting asked these questions uh, the, the overarching point for me Dan is slightly bizarre in that they, stu- they do seem to accept that there have been six and a half thousand deaths in the country it's just like where those are appropriated and ultimately who cares where they're appropriated like it's it's un, uh, it's not not in, not up for discussion that they've happened it just seems so bizarre that um like you know look at i think overall it's important for us to have this conversation because i do think in a couple of weeks time when all this is done that that the circus as i've said before moves on and, and nobody discusses it anymore i think whatever uh, uh, spotlight we can give it now um is is all it's ever going to get right because i think once this thing moves on in a couple of weeks it moves out of people's consciousness we all forget about it we talk a little bit about the world cup and this stuff it becomes a footnote 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I know they're talking about maybe going for the Olympics and, and mm. I assume they still want to bring some big sporting events here. So I think they possibly will see people in time, um, you know, referring back to, to Qatar and, and seeing what's happened. I mean, this is the thing about visiting here now for the tournament. I mean, we're not seeing the the, the real Qatar as, a, as it normally functions. Like a lot of the construction projects have stopped. You know, they didn't want people to necessarily... Uh, be able to film or capture, you know, take photos of sort of uh, people working, you know, outdoors and sort of pretty like, I mean, it's, it's, it is winter here. Um, so it's not as oppressively warm as it, as it, as it will be, you know, in, the, in their summer months. But um, they have like stopped a lot of the, the work that would normally be taking place here. So mm. I think if you were, if someone was to come back next month, they would see a completely different picture. I mean, I had a, a cab driver the other day who works in construction who's just become a cab driver for the month. And a lot of people have done that. There's a lot of like taxi drivers who are just, um, you know, they, 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 their, their job has stopped and they need to find something else for the month. So again, like, you know, the, the picture that people are getting in their time here isn't actually really reflective possibly of the real Qatar in a lot of ways and that's something you have to be conscious of when you uh, when you hear some of the reviews from people about you know how, how wonderful a time they're having I mean th that doesn't have any like this is a this is a show that rolls in and and exists off its own rules to a point um for a month and then yeah normal life here will continue from next month and that's going to be a very different normal life for a lot of people that are here can I ask you about that like normal life bit and um, like look uh, I think Gavin Cooney was making the point uh, on this show and elsewhere as well over the last 24 hours that how are we supposed to know about normal life where being sort of whisked around sort of almost Disneyland-esque from, from one venue to another as tends to happen at all of these tournaments but the stuff like the, the and I only ask it really Dan in terms of the point that you valid point that you make about the Olympics and other major sporting events potentially coming down the track the stuff that Gary Neville and like Richard Keyes and the uh, World Cup CEO uh, Tam Tell us about the slow improvements around conditions there, the treatment of gay people, the demolition of the kafala system. Have you any sense as to, like, is that a PR job or is there is some of that actually uh, rooted in reality? Well, I mean, I, this is the thing. Like, you know, you would you would chat to people who would, who would you know, I would have had a conversation with someone who would have spoke about uh, times recently where, uh, you know, the non-payment of, of workers, like, would be an issue and, uh a couple of people went out onto the street to, to protest and, and his claim was that those people were were then deported for for doing that you know and there's still um you always have this element of um you know is the issue really just with rogue companies as opposed to Qatar the state which would be a, a sort of a, a, a quite a common defense you would hear is that you know Qatar can't claim responsibility you know for the actions of of every employer operating within their jurisdiction even though everything within the, this jurisdiction is controlled you know from, from from above like from the top you know so um no and this is the thing like you, you can't you, like you can't really get that sense like i i saw uh, miguel delaney had a piece where it was I thought it was a good line and it sort of resonates a bit. Like people make a reference to the locals, but actually, like, the locals aren't... Like, you, during my time here, I haven't really encountered anyone who's from Qatar, you know, as in yeah. you, you see people walking around, but I haven't had a conversation with anyone because they're not doing any of the, the sort of the the jobs that are left to the people who are pointing you to the metro, who are, uh, you know, the, the security staff and hotels or the, the places where you encounter people. It's all, uh, you know, this this is where all the migrant workers are. You know, this is how society functions here. They are the engine that sort of drives the whole place. Um, and, yeah, like, within that, like, there is obviously just a sense that, yeah, like, there's some people here very, I mean, I've chatted to a couple of people who are very content with their life, but even they will say that they accept that they are the luckier ones. You know, they know that they are the luckier ones because they all know of people living in pretty difficult uh, conditions. And uh, so uh, I know that the point will be made that there have been improvements in recent years that, that, that Qatar might be further along the road than some other places even in this in this region. Mm. Um, but it's still clear that, that they have a hell of a road to travel. There's enough stories have come out about... Um, various sort of uh, 
uh, like you know episodes that have occurred to, to to people isolated. But it's again, it's very much out of sight. As I said, like we're seeing it. Uh, uh, Disneyland definitely is something that springs to mind when you have all these games you can go to and these clean metro stations and everything looks wonderful but it's sometimes it's what you don't see as well and I think even around where I'm staying there's a lot of um, just like a like a lot of abandoned sites and a lot of stuff, you know, seems to have they've these buildings and they've they're looking for someone to fill them. Like you know, there's advertisements everywhere for you know office space for for hire. And I asked someone about this, and they're like, yeah, this is all around the city, but they they don't have they don't have the 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 the, the businesses to go into them. So um, I don't know. Like I I, I part of me would be fascinated to come back in four or five years and to see. You know, because it is obviously trying to like style itself as, you know, as, as a rival in some ways to Dubai and the whole David Beckham thing. If you're if you're flying uh, on Qatar Airways here, like there's a in-flight movie of David Beckham, and it's called like David Beckham's Qatar Stopover, or words to that effect. So they're clearly trying to like aim it at that sort of high-end tourist market, but mm. it doesn't appear to be finished in a lot of ways and. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's uh, you really are like you're 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 examining everything you see uh, all the time to see yeah. is is this is this real? If it's uh, if it's good enough for Bex, it's good enough for me. Like I can I can I can mix it with Bex if uh, you know. It's oh, a sort of a weird. Like, yeah. uh, it's a, I always find yeah. that one it's a slightly weird one. Uh, um, mm. What ju- one last one on it, Dan? Right, because I I, I I think it was important to talk about it. Right, and we will we'll talk about the quarterfinals upcoming. And I know you were at the Louis Van Gaal press conference today, so I definitely want to get your insights on that. But you're obviously uh, I don't think it's any disrespect to say a veteran now of these tournaments. What is your if you God. if you <laughs> I say it with, with respect? I've been at some of them with you. Mm. Um, what the what's the uh, if you were to forget about all that stuff we've just been spoken about and you were just dropped in there without the context of all of that stuff that's been on over the last few years? What's your sense of it as a tournament versus some of the other World Cups or Euros you've been at? Yeah. Um, no, I think, I mean, uh, I think the group stage was good. You know, I think, uh, I think again, like, it's, it's such a strange tournament because of the amount of games you can attend. Like, it doesn't even compare to other tournaments in some ways. Like, you're able to go to, like, two games per day. Um, so you've probably seen a lot of football, actually, relative to, to previous tournaments and probably a little bit, have a little more of a sense of, you know, seen a quite a large number of teams and a large number of games. Um, and from perspective of like the level of the football, I think it's been, I think it's been good. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the drama of the group stages at the end of it was was up there with probably favorably with it, with any sort of group stage of recent memory, I think. And look, it also drives home the madness of potentially changing that format in four years' time. Um, which is again like one of these things that will annoy you. Like the World Cup works as it does, you know, and it's such a it's such a great competition as it as it stands and it doesn't need to be tinkered with and it doesn't need to be tainted by, you know, being being brought to the wrong places. Um and you know, it's it's uh I think as a football experience, been able to see a lot of games. Yeah, it has. Like it's been, it's been good. I think. I mean, the round of sixteen didn't necessarily ignite, but the, in some ways, like the reward for that is that you have these heavyweight quarterfinals that are coming up. You know that in some ways, uh, you didn't want too many shocks at that stage because it's sort of created a drama now that does exist around the last day. And I think there's eight good stories in there. I love uh, I love a good good lot of heavyweights in the quarterfinals. I won't lie, don't like to see too many minnows getting in there. What? Uh, how many of these games are you going to get to? Well, no, they they just it'll be two. So um, they they don't allow you to do two games per oh, day. Oh, do they not? In the, in the in the knockouts, in the no knockouts, way. they don't. No, no. Even no, though so, geographically uh, it easily done, I presume. It could be done feasibly, yeah. And there obviously will be uh, there will be FIFA people doing it. I mean, I went for Tino will be on the will be on yeah. the screen. One minute into it, mm. uh, into all of the games, but no media-wise, no. I, I, I suppose the reason for that would be extra time and, and penalties and, and the delays caused by that. Um, I presume so, yeah, there's I'm a glamour going, for the two late games, is there? In that case, so I, I'm going to the two late games to, to Holland, Argentina, and England and France. Yeah, yeah um, and yeah, there. I, I think the thing is there is a clamour for these games, but uh, Brazil are still a huge draw, obviously as well for obvious reasons. So the fact that you've got Brazil and Argentina mm-hmm. on the same day is possibly divided. Um, some of the media hordes that were here. So uh, I've got into the game anyway. I think some people might have been a little bit nervous about being rejected, but that hasn't proven to be the case. 
there might be uh, there might be a few empty seats that they might be able to uh, the one thing that we're, we're fairly certain of what um, mm. th- I was sort of slightly on the fence to be honest about the Netherlands uh, Argentina game until I saw some clips from the Louis van Gaal press conference today and now I'm firmly I want Argen- I want uh, Netherlands all the way or I have to say keep them in the tournament as long as we can what happened? Yeah well I mean he's, he's sort of a uh He's in sort of in feisty form, Van Gaal. Now, I suppose like this isn't a huge surprise. I mean, you, I suppose remember his time at Manchester United, he would have had some back and forth uh, with various people. But mm. I think like uh, a theme of the, the Dutch tournament has been uh, the style of play that Van Gaal is playing. Um, you know, in Holland they would view like the, the wing back system. You know, the three five two or five three two or however you want to describe it as quite defensive and against their traditional principles. And he's received criticism from that you know throughout the tournament. And he seemed to have come to the press conference today in the mood to uh, have a few digs at people, uh, regardless of whether they ask questions or or if was the subject matter had come up. Uh, or not so yeah I mean from the start like he's 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 been asked about um, the fact that, and this is true like they will be comfortably outnumbered in the stadium the 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 Holland fans like I think you know he, he was making a reference to the fact that oh yeah there might be four, 40,000 Argentines there and only 1400 Dutch but then he did make the point of saying that's 400 more than some people were uh, expecting and he named this journalist who's been writing negative columns about him it was but like a Dunphy Jack Charlton style thing or something because this critic was in the audience, you know, and then later asked a question that uh, Van Gaal didn't like at all um, and, and had, a, had a go back at him. Uh, so the story then transpires, and look, we're getting this through the, uh, through the earpiece because it's, it's a back and forth in, in Dutch. Um, and the interpreter, I have to say, and I was working overtime here because there was a real sort of... Uh, argument of some descriptions but it turns out that this reporter had filed a story earlier in the week about finding van gaal's phone in a toilet um and he had found van gaal's phone and he recognized it was in Van Gaal's phone because there was a picture of van gaal with his wife as the sort of screensaver and it's i mean it's just a really bizarre story even as you're telling it it's just yeah. a bit odd you know and like van gaal refused to take a question from him uh, about defensive tactics or something and then you know you can make your own answer up just like you did finding my phone in the toilet and like <laughs> everyone in the room is a bit like what, what what's actually happening here like what's going on here and uh like memphis then this 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 guy asked memphis to buy if if he thought of van gaal as a bit like an embarrassing uncle or a fun uncle um and Depay didn't like that question either. So there was just a weird little, little bit of a vibe to it. But the next minute he was like cracking jokes and laughing about how, uh, you know, he, he was going to give Memphis a, a big kiss now, you know, because mm-hmm. they got on great. They didn't always get on great. And like on the way out of the room, he was smiling and, you know, chatting and posing for a selfie with people. So like one minute you could you could listen to one clip and say, God, he was in really bad form today. And you can listen to another and say, geez, he was in great form today. But the whole thing was sort of, it's kind of box office in its own way. Like he's actually just this big personality mm. who's like very at ease in this room of the international media. It's like this is where he was born to be. Um, but they are the underdogs, and and possibly like he 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 he's, he's at pains to point out that the style of football that they're playing is the way you need to play now to su- to succeed, and that is basically the underlying message that ran through the whole thing. Yeah, and I like look at it. maybe Australia played above themselves, and uh, that's Argentina have a higher ceiling to get to. It'll, it's a it is in some ways a hard one to call. Um, your expectation then on, on uh, Saturday evening, Dan? What's the football coming home, or what are we thinking at this stage? Um, I'm not sure if it's coming home now, um, but you certainly look at that England team, and you think that at some stage in the next decade, it probably probably will come home, mm. um, just with the profile of their squad. Um, I'm not so sure. I mean, I've been to, I've, be, I've seen probably more fans than England um, here, just in terms of the games I've been at. And the one thing you can't get away from is just such an obvious point. But like, it's just Mbappe's form is just out of this world, you know, and mm. practically like very, you know, almost impossible to defend against in some ways. And even even Poland, like, you know, Poland probably did a lot of the right things um, to counter him, and they still, well, he still scored two amazing goals. And um, I think the England side are really good. I think they're capable of beating France. There's a lot of reasons to believe, you know, you can construct an argument as to why they will do it. Um, 
But I just think maybe that the French front four, the movement even of Griezmann, who's been very, very good in that role, and that even if England get a little bit distracted by the Mbappe task, it just opens up uh, options for other players. So I'd be leaning in, in the way of, of, of France just about doing it. But I have to say, I think if England got through... Um, I, although Portugal were very good, I still think I'd possibly fancy England against the winners of the other um, of the other quarterfinals. So I really feel like this is a this is a huge game for them. You know, it's 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 definitely there for them. I think it's a fair point. Uh, I don't know. Certainly, one of the joys of being at uh, covering a major tournament like that is that you just get to focus on it and nothing else for the duration. So I don't know if Martin O'Neill's comments have bubbled into your timeline over the last twenty four hours. So this is to do with uh, Declan Rice and Jack Grealish. Exactly, yeah. He yeah. said that he was, uh, you know, he didn't want to coerce them into playing for Ireland. Yeah. That it was the wrong thing to do. He said, he said, to summarise it, try, try and summarise it as simply as I can, uh, he said that, you know, the question came up about the two lads playing for Ireland and he said, look, at the games of friendly matches, didn't want to just cap them at full senior international level in a proper capped game for the sake of doing it and coerce them into playing for Ireland that it needed to be a decision that they were happy and comfortable with to make themselves. I have to say, I kind of felt as if it made some sense what he was saying, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think there's, there's almost two different cases, right? The, the Grealish one, um, you know, you would chat to people who were around the dressing room with Grealish even at 21's level and I think there was people who always had the sense that he would jump, you know, or had a feeling that his, his preference was to go that way. I think the Royce one is the uncomfortable one for O'Neill still. And like I, at, at the time, I wouldn't have been madly critical of him because... You know, the whole concept of bringing someone on, you know, against Moldova, you know, in the 90th minute to tie them down, like, I wouldn't be crazy about it. Mm. Um, but then, as it happened... OTB AM With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating...